Hello, and thank you for joining the June Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston board meeting. At this time, the Boston Planning and Development Agency is continuing to host public meetings in a virtual setting for the health, safety, and accessibility of Boston residents. For more information and updates, visit bostonplans.org. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications. At Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Files Channel 962. It's also being live streamed at uh, Boston. I'll take a roll call of the members to begin. Uh, Mr. Monahan. Mr. Monahan. Oh, present, okay, sorry. Uh, present. Okay, uh, Dr. Lansmark. Present. Uh, Mr. Miller? Present. All right, and I, Priscilla Rojas, am present. Okay, item number one. Request authorization for the approval of the minutes of the May 12th, uh, 2022 meeting. Uh, motion is in order. So move. Um. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number two. Request authorization to enter into a lease agreement with Topologic Incorporated for the use of Suite 805, which is approximately 2,928 square feet located at 12 Channel Street within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Topologic is a contact manufacturing company uh, utilizing compact digital knitting machines to fabricate custom knitting clothing products. <clears throat> Uh, we're requesting entry into a five-year lease for suite number 805 and 12th Channel Street, which, as you said, consists of about 2,928 square feet. The lease would commence in July of 2022, not only next month. However, suite 805 will not be ready immediately for occupancy until August of 2022. Uh, we would propose to temporarily locate uh, Topologic in uh, suite 505 for 30 to 60 days until suite 805 is ready for that. Uh, suite 505 is half the size of 805, so it's not the long-term solution, but we're very happy to have a stopgap measure to assist the company to get started. Uh, fixed rent would start at $30 per square foot, or roughly $87,800 per year, and will increase annually uh, by an additional dollar per square foot. <clears throat> uh, EDSC was introduced to Topologic by a commercial real estate firm, Honeyman, who has earned a real estate commission in this transaction um, as a result of the transaction. And also for Honeyman's assistance in finalizing these negotiations and explaining uh, the market to their tenant, which is the company's job. So they, they definitely need to. Uh, the fee would be negotiated in a separate agreement, um, and it's expected to be less than $25,000. Um, although Topologic is a startup company, uh, they closed on some venture capital funding this week. I personally spoke with the venture capital uh, firm to confirm that the funds can be used towards paying rent to EDIC. And was confirmed uh, to be affirmative on that. Uh, during the term of the lease, EDIC will receive over $445,000, and that's after paying real estate commission to 100. Uh, so, with your approval, uh, if I have any questions, I'll be very happy to welcome another manufacturing company to Paul Dale Street. And uh, that concludes my presentation. And uh, we'll have any questions later. Thank you, Dennis. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, the motion is in order. So moved. Second. In. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, thank you. Uh, next item, item number three. Request authorization to enter into a license agreement with Mass Bay Brewing Company Incorporated to allow Har Harpoon to reopen the outdoor hospitality space on a small par portion of parcel S3 before the Mr. Swindle, Swindle's traveling peculiarium and drink quarry garden within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park, Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll abbreviate that for Mr. Swindle's going forward. But, uh, Mass Bay Brewing Company, or Health Brewing, has been a tenant on the Marine Park since 1987. Um, they have been in negotiations with an adult circus, as you said, called Mr. Swindle's. Uh, based on representations made and um, checking out the Mr. Swindle's website, uh, it's best compared to Circus Solo. It's an adult-oriented uh, uh, service. It's, it's uh, 
uh, so I'm not saying the children, but it's 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 an adult or you know, that's why it's not so right. Uh, permit request and permission to host Mr. Swindles on a portion of the premises that was until recently used as the outdoor beer garden or hospitality space. The surface is proposed from October 5th to November 8th of 2022. Um, hosting a surface is a new business model for both Harpoon and EDAC. Um, Harpoon and um, Harpoon is expending considerable upfront costs to finance the relocation and set up of the surface before the first ticket is even sold. Harpoon and EDIC staff have agreed on a business model that, that we think is fair in this, uh, for this inaugural event. Harpoon will continue to pay to EDIC 12.5% of gross receipts for beer sales, all liquor sales actually, uh, in the event, which is consistent with our business arrangement for the outdoor uh, beer garden. Um, and they will also pay us 6% of the first $400,000 in tickets and merchandise, 12.5% of the uh, subsequent $400,000, and 15% of any revenue they receive over $800,000. It's not possible today to forecast the revenue expected. However, I personally believe that the business model is very fair under the circumstances. Hopefully, it will be a success, and we will repeat this exercise again next year. Uh, we'll, where we will have a full year of quantified economics to consider when negotiating that year's group. Uh, but for now, I'm requesting permission to allow Harpoon to host Mr. Swindle Circus uh, for October and November of 2022 only on the terms and conditions I just discussed. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Okay. Item number four. Request authorization to enter into a license agreement, or sorry, request authorization to enter into a lease agreement with Droplet Incorporated for the use of storage cage B7, which is approximately 1,236 square feet located at 12 Channel Street within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Several years ago, EDIC installed a series of chain link storage cages uh, in different sizes in the basement of 12 Channel Street to both service, uh, serve the increasing storage needs of 12 Channel Street tenants and to take advantage of a revenue generating opportunity. The EPA recently conducted a market analysis of storage facilities and we determined that a fair rate to charge 12 Channel Street tenants for the use of the storage cages is $15 per square foot. Droplet has been attending the 12 Channel Street since 2020 and currently occupies three suites. Droplet, they develop a device uh, for needle-free delivery of non-intravenous medicine below the skin line. It's basically a device you just rub on your feet scan and obviously on the simple fire. Um, they only need additional storage space and would like to license what we labeled as cave B7, consisting of uh, just over 1,200 square feet in the basement, uh, proposing a three and a half your term and um, with the fee calculated at $15 per square foot would, would result in an annual fee of $18,540 and over the term of the proposed uh, agreement we will receive a minimum of $66,400 during the Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Seconder. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Okay. Item number five, request authorization to extend the lease agreement with Mass Robotics Incorporated for the continued use of cage 1E, which is approximately 326 square feet, located at 12 Channel Street within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll skip the preamble, which is identical to the previous item. Uh, Mass Robotics has been attending 12 Channel Street since 2017. We occupy two suites in the building. Um, uh, Mass Robotics is a shared working collaborative, uh, similar to WeWork, uh, over into, it's specifically for uh, robotics companies, uh, a lot of startups. So there's a lot of robot, robotic companies up to 50 at any time in 12 Channel Street within Mass Robotics space. Uh, they're in need of additional storage space and they'd like to license uh, the cage that we labeled as 1E, which is much smaller than the previous one, it's 350 square feet. Uh, at the same $15 per square foot, we're proposing a five-year license, uh, which would result in an annual fee of $4,890. Uh, 
and during the term of the proposed license, we would receive um, just under twenty-five thousand dollars for the proposed change. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right. Item number six. Request authorization to award a contract to Gale Associates, Inc. for Design Services and Construction Administration to repair the loading dock platform and roof overhang canopy located at 12 Channel Street within the Raymond Alflin Marine Park in an amount not to exceed $185,000. Uh, William. Thank you, Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, this request is for authorization to execute a design contract with Gale Associates for 12 Channel Street to repair the loading dock platform in the Marine Park. This matter was last before you at the December 2021 board meeting. As you may recall, 12 Channel Street is a nine story masonry building originally constructed by the U.S. military in 1941. Uh, it's currently a light industrial manufacturing building with several tenants. The building has a loading dock that wraps around three of the four sides of the building, each covered with a concrete awning or overhang. Both the wraparound loading dock and the overhang show sign deterioration, which require repair to maintain serviceability and public safety. This project seeks to extend the service life another 30 years. The design work will include a structural assessment and repair drawings toward the condition of the loading dock and bring the assembly up to current codes. Plans and specifications will be prepared in accordance with Chapter 149 of the Massachusetts General Laws. The contract will also include bid assistance, resident engineering services, and construction administration. The agency issued a formal request for qualifications in accordance with Chapter 7C of the Massachusetts General Laws on April 14th of this year. The process included outreach to disadvantaged firms, and a pre-submission conference was held. Six firms submitted qualifications in response to the solicitation on May 16th. A designer selection committee was assembled to review each submitting team's qualifications and relevant experience. Based on that review and uh, follow up with the respondents, the committee unanimously recommends the design contract be awarded to Gale Associates. The total contract value would be for $185,000. It has been appropriately budgeted for in the fiscal year 22 capital budget. Therefore, we are requesting the director be authorized to enter into this contract. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Right. Item number seven. Request authorization to award a contract for engineering services to STV Incorporated for the realignment of Fid Kennedy Avenue within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park and an amount not to exceed $130,000. $229.78, William. Thank you again. Uh, this matter was last before you at the December 2021 board meeting. Fid Kennedy Avenue is planned um, for a primary truck route. It currently is one and it was planned to remain one. And it terminates at the Northern Avenue Rotary. Uh, Massport owns that rotary and they are looking into changes in that intersection to make it more efficient. Most likely it'll turn into a signalized intersection. Um, that coupled with the potential redevelopment of the V1 parking lot off the Leader Bank uh, Pavilion in the Marine Park, a concept is needed for the realignment of Fid Kennedy Avenue that will both maximize trucking efficiency, pedestrian and bicyclist safety, as well as maximize the future development potential of the V1 parking lot. This contract will include engagement with all of the impacted stakeholders, including the Marine Park, it's Massport, the City of Boston, um, their transportation departments and their public works departments and it will inform the study and assessment and result in three concepts for consideration. So the agency issued a RFP uh, in April of this year. The process included outreach to disadvantaged firms. 40 interested parties downloaded the RFP. Four firms submitted uh, a response to the solicitation on May 4th. A designer selection committee was assembled to review each submitting team's qualifications, experience, and the proposed fee. And based on that review, the committee unanimously recommended the engineering contract be awarded to STV Incorporated. STV has extensive experience in this type of roadway infrastructure planning and design, and they are uniquely qualified in that they have multiple in-house architectural engineering disciplines, which are needed for this particular study. Um, the total contract award is for $130,229.78 and has been appropriately budgeted for in the FY22 capital budget. Therefore, 
we're requesting authorization for the director to enter into this contract. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? <laughs> Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Uh, roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Mr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The motion passes. Item number eight. Request authorization to award a contract for engineering services to Green International Affiliates, Inc. for the storm drainage inspection and assessment project within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park in an amount not to exceed $680,923.89. Uh, William. Thank you again. This matter was last before the November 2021 board meeting. Uh, you may recall the project site consists of approximately three miles of roadway infrastructure and includes an independent storm drainage system. Uh, that system consists of 211 maintenance holes, 255 catch basins, nearly a mile of drainage pipe, and two outs into Boston Harbor. This system was originally constructed in the 1930s by the U.S. military, and the last comprehensive assessment dates back to 1995. Uh, we look to facilitate the intended transfer of the Marine Park roadways to the city of Boston, and this contract will seek to design upgrades to the system that meet both uh, BWSC and NRA standards. It would also look to make improvements to advance climate resiliency to handle storm surges and increase sea level rises. Uh, plans and specifications would be prepared in accordance with Chapter 3039M of the Massachusetts General Laws. Contract would include permitting, bidding assistance, resident engineering services, and construction administration services. The agency issued a request for proposals on April 4th of 2022. This process included outreach to disadvantaged firms with 29 interested parties downloading the solicitation. Two firms submitted proposals. The designer selection committee was assembled to review each qualifications experience and their proposed fee. And based on that review, the committee unanimously recommends the engineering contract be awarded to Green International. Green is a certified MBE and has extensive experience uh, inspecting, assessing, and improvements to the city's uh, infrastructure, storm drainage infrastructure with the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. The total contract award is for $680,923.89 and has been appropriately budgeted for in the FY22 capital budget. Therefore, we are requesting authorization for the director to enter into this contract. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number nine. Uh, request authorization to award a contract to Greenman Peterson Incorporated for engineering design services for the Street Survey and Public Improvement Commission documentation for the street transfer project within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park in an amount not to exceed $592,310. William. Again, it's a busy month for the capital team. <laughs> yes. So this request is for an engineering design contract and the matter was last before you at the November 2021 board meeting. Uh, you may recall this project, uh, it is very closely related to the previous uh, board vote uh, looking to transfer the city's roadways to the city of Boston. Uh, this looks to assess the roadway infrastructure to make sure that it is up to transportation and public works so that we can facilitate that transfer. Uh, this, this contract would include the, uh, the, the survey, the assessment, the collaboration and coordination with the city's ADs and result in plans and specifications prepared in accordance with Chapter 3039M of the Massachusetts General Laws. The contract would also include permitting, bidding assistance, and resident engineering service. Uh, we issued the request for proposals at the same time as the last board vote on April 4th. Uh, 27 interested parties uh, downloaded the solicitation, two submitted proposals. The designer selection committee was assembled, reviewed each team qualifications, experience, and fee, and unanimously recommended the engineering contract be awarded to GPI. Uh, the contract award is for $592,310. It was appropriately budgeted for in the FY22 capital budget. Therefore, we are requesting the director has authorization to enter into this contract with Freeman Peterson Incorporated, known as GPI. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions or comments from the board? Yeah. Uh, well, you might, I could just use your perspective on yes. the last two uh, items. It looked like we had 27 potentially interested parties, but only two real bidders. Any, any feel for you know, why we have so, so few bidders on these projects? I, th I think ultimately it just comes down to the significant amount of work that these firms have before them, and they get to be quite selective in who they go after. 
um, we, we did follow up with folks and that was really the overall comment was that they just have a lot of work and they're being uh, very selective in, in which projects they go after. Fair enough. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Okay. Item number 10. Request authorization to, um, to execute a design contract amendment with STV Incorporated for additional construction inspector services for the roadway and streetscape improvements to Northern Avenue within the Raymond Alpine Marine Park in an amount not to exceed $55,182.88, William. Thank you. So this matter was last before September of last year when we awarded the construction project. This associated design contract needs to be amended to increase the contract amount by $55,182 to allow for continued full-time inspection by the engineer of record of this continual work that is currently underway along Northern Avenue. You may recall that project is installing separate bicycle lanes and pedestrian sidewalks um, to increase multimodal means of transportation within the marine park while also maintaining a trucking efficiency. The resulting amended co total contract amount would be $284,434.55. And this additional amount has been appropriately budgeted for in the FY22 capital budget. Therefore, we request an authorization for the director to amend this contract with STV as described. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So move. Second. Roll we'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair. Aye. Motion passes. Item number 11, request authorization to execute a design contract amendment with Studio E&E Incorporated for additional design and construction uh, administration services for the 12 Channel Street stair pressurization project within the Raymond Alflin Marine Park in an amount not to exceed $153,519. William. Thank you. So this project was last before you in January of last year uh, for the authorization to award this design contract that we're looking to amend. Uh, we need to increase the contract amount by $153,519 to accommodate certain unforeseen conditions and design constraints. The resulting amended total contract amount will be $333,519. Originally, we contemplated the central stairwell, stairwell A, being the one that would be modified to create a smoke-free uh, emergency egress pressurization system. Uh, well into the design of these modifications, it was determined that we would need to abandon the central stairwell, stairwell A, and pivot to a front and center stairwell, stairwell B. Uh, with that as well, there was additional work that had to be done, so we had to redesign the work, um, and it also triggered some additional requirements, specifically some rooftop screening that had to be designed. Um, so uh, we are looking to increase the contract amount, uh, as, as, as earlier said, to redesign this work and to again the additional requirements of the rooftop screen. Um, the current FY22 budget is, a, is appropriate for this amendment and uh, therefore we're asking for authorization for the director to uh, amend this contract strike. Stumbled there just a little bit. Apologize if there are any questions I'm happy to answer. Them. Okay you've uh, got a couple of these in a row. So, right. um, uh, any questions or comments from the board? Is this a uh, minority or women-owned firm? They are yes uh, and, and MWBE. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. <clears throat> vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, item number 12. Request authorization to award three-year contracts for general repairs and maintenance services on an as-needed basis for EDIC-owned properties to ACK Marine and General Contracting, LLC, D'Alessandro Corporation, Fleming Brothers Incorporation, um, June Enterprises, Inc., uh, Sanibel Electric Corp., and Scott's Industrial and Commercial Painting, Inc., in an amount not to exceed $800,000 annually. Laura. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, my name is Laura Melly. I'm the Deputy Director for Real Estate Administration. I'm requesting authorization to award a package of as-needed contracts 
for general repair and maintenance services at BPDA properties. I'll note this is a joint procurement with the EDIC acting as the lead jurisdiction on behalf of the BRA, so this matter will also appear on the BRA agenda later this afternoon. As you know, BPDA staff manage our property as though we live next door, and our staff are supported by a variety of contractors across specialized trades. Uh, these general repair and maintenance services have typically been handled as one-offs or addressed through one large contract with a single general contractor. But our goal through this work order program is to put contracts in place with diverse group of vendors. Um, and, and if our staff has access to multiple as needed contracts, the BPDA will be more strategic and proactive and will be able to respond more quickly to urgent issues across all neighborhoods. I'll note this is the third of three work order programs that were strategic priorities for the real estate department this fiscal year, following the real estate strategy consultant and the house doctor architecture and engineering programs approved by the board in recent months. The scope of services for this program will include both public works or horizontal site uh, repair work and building or vertical repair work across 13 categories. Given the range of services and expertise that we're looking for, we are awarding up to three contracts in each service category. Each contract will be for a term of three years and BPDA staff do not expect the aggregate value of the program to exceed $800,000 annually. We received 27 bids submitted by six unique firms, again, across the 13 categories. Um, and three of those six firms are certified as MWBEs, uh, minority and woman owned business entities. All of the firms are qualified and there were no more than three bids per category. Therefore, we are uh, planning to award to all respondents and are requesting authorization to enter into these six general repair contracts. With that, thank you very much for your consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? I have one question, Madam Chair. Laura, um, I assume this is being bid through Chapter 149? Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, it's like a joint 3039M149, but we went with the sort of uh, most stringent uh, procurement requirements. Is the low bidder being selected? We, we were awarding to up to we are awarding to the three lowest bids in each category. And so we actually didn't receive more than three bids in any of the categories. And so we were able to award to everybody. So in some cases, there's actually multiple folks um, available to us in each category. And we'll go through a work order quote process to, to select the best partner for each job. It's kind of a follow up to Brian's question earlier, if you heard it, but I'm not sure you, I don't think he asked of you. Are these uh, coming in over budget? At this point, we've we've the bids consisted of hourly rates for a sample representative project. Um, I, I think I think we would have more to share with you after reflecting on a few months of the program. I do know that you know supply and material transportation costs are increasing everywhere, um, but we do feel that the that the hourly rates we have locked in are a great value. Um, but I, I will say that we're seeing the cost increases that that everybody's seeing. So there's no man hours associated with the numbers, just hourly rates. Right. We we put a placeholder uh, number of hours to in order to do an apples to apples comparison, but the actual cost will depend on each specific work order as the needs come up, and so that's why we'll actually request a quote when we have a specific job, so that we can get a, get a price for a specific project before we move forward. Like, oh, we have to do roadway repairs in a certain area. We would get quotes for that from the folks that are on the contract. Okay, from my experience in this end of the business, the lowest bid hourly rate doesn't mean it's the cheapest price because of productivity and because of just experience on laying a job out, et cetera. So the number can look like it's the cheapest hourly rate, but at the end, you're paying more money. You know, that's, yeah. that would be that's good. So thank you. I think that's it. Yeah, I'll just say we're very excited for that reason to have multiple folks in most categories so that we can, you know, work with different partners, build capacity, you know, find the best way to work together because I think that's a very valid insight. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions um, or comments? Okay, uh, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Uh, we'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Mr. Landmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Your votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, uh, item number 13 has been removed. Uh, on to item number 14, request authorization to award a consulting services contract with Deloitte Consulting, LLP, to conduct a compensation study in an amount not to exceed $217,466.60. Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. We are seeking approval to award a contract to engage Deloitte Consulting 
for compensation study services. This action will allow the BPVA to review a good proportion of our positions benchmark against the industry we are hiring from and ensure that the BPVA is, com is paying competitive salaries for top talent. Twice, the BPVA made an effort to seek competitive proposals from organizations that provide this service. Our, our first RFP was released in November 2021, and responses were supposed to come back in early July. Suppliers rightfully noted this was not a convenient time of year to be preparing a proposal. The project timeline was too short, and staff would need more time to prepare proposals. We took that feedback into consideration and released a second RFP. We did receive proposals. However, the review committee determined that none of those proposals were advantageous for the BPDA. Uh, uh, they were unable, uh, the BPDA uh, wears many hats, so to speak, and so it's kind of tricky to put a study like this together in a cost-effective manner. Therefore, we leveraged the state purchasing platform. Deloitte was determined to offer the best price for our specific needs. We have reviewed a statement of work and are confident that by awarding this contract, the BPDA will be a more competitive employer. This concludes my remarks, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? I just have one quick question. How frequently do we do compensation studies? Do we, I mean, do we have a cadence for it, or is it like something driving it? I believe the best practice, Teresa, you might want to hop in with this one. Sure. Um, so we did our first ever compensation study in 2016 or 17, and then we updated it uh, annually um, until 2019, I believe. So it hasn't been updated recently. We are. What Deloitte is going to do is sort of just a comprehensive review of, of all of our salary bands and our, our position. So it's almost like we're doing it all over again. So it's very, it'll be, it'll be very, very thorough. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, I believe the motion is in order. So moved. Second. Uh, roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, item number 15, request authorization to approve the Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston, FY23 budget, Michelle. Hello again, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, Madam Secretary, members of the audience, hello, I am Michelle Goldberg, the Director of Finance for the BPDA. Uh, thank you for allowing me this time. Are we able to um, present screen? I don't have that capability, Teresa, I'm not sure. Yes, yes. We're going to bring that up. It is up, Michelle. Oh, it's on there. Great. Um, I am before you seeking approval for the FY23 operating capital budget. We are currently in the EDIC portion of the agenda. I will be presenting a combined look at the BPDA. At the conclusion of this presentation, we will seek a vote for the EDIC and the BRA vote will be towards the end of the agenda tonight. I would also like to take a moment to express appreciation before we dive in for all the collaborative teamwork that went into building this budget. Thank you to everyone in finance, real estate, the secretary's office, the director's office, planning, IT, all the leaders across the agency who have helped put this year's budget together. It's really appreciated. Um, with that, we can move to the next slide. And one more slide, please. It is important to start each budget process with taking a look at our values and priorities. These next three slides will show the various ways we seek to honor the commitment to transparency, predictability, and the creation of opportunity. Those big ideas require us to take action. Every budget cycle is an opportunity to enhance the process so we continue to improve in areas to uh, communicate with our department heads and update our report more frequently. Next slide, please. Over the past several years, the BPDA has been able to reduce our long-term liabilities. The BPDA is in a strong financial position because of the efforts made by many across the agency. We have implemented creative solutions to keep uh, health costs, uh, sorry, benefits costs low as healthcare costs rise. 
those efforts allow for more strategic budget investments. Next slide, please. And finally, this process is supporting a robust growth throughout the agency as we seek to link data that we have with all of the amazing work that this organization is doing. As we expand our efforts in supplier diversity and community outreach, for example, the BPDA needs to be able to have the systems to collect the data that drives our work in real time. Next slide, please. As a quick reminder in our budget presentation, I like to remind folks um, we are actually a collection of agencies. Structurally, we have three corporations and two 501c3s. We have multiple general ledgers and use an interagency grant to make sure everything is balanced and prepared for uh, the uh, various audits that we have to go through. But from a financial perspective, we are the EDIC and the BRA functioning as the BPDA. Next slide, please. Just briefly, we'll move into our operating budget. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so you'll see here a summary of our table. From a revenue point of view, uh, we'll start talking about FY22 so that folks can see in order to be sure about the plan for next year we have to uh, have solid projections for the end of our current year. We report to this body every quarter and the trend has remained consistent. Low spending in FY22, coupled with strong revenue performance, is resulting in a fiscal year operating surplus for FY22. We know, of course, that our activities play out over a longer period of time, and we now maintain reserves with the help of this body to be sure that we can match up one-time revenue with one-time expenses that don't take place at the same time. So the operating surplus that we're seeing in FY22 will result in additional funding in our reserves. Each year, the BPDA resets from a budgetary perspective. We determine what revenue will be collected in the next fiscal year and then decide what expenses we are able to afford. That is going to lead us to the next column for our FY22 budget. Next slide, please. Uh, so from a sources and uses perspective, right here we have the breakdown of our revenue. Uh, you can see right here that from a revenue point of view, um, the categories as a whole, our rental and leases income is growing. OWD grants and donations will also be seeing a large increase in the next fiscal year. With the FY23 budget, parking now makes up a significant portion of our projected revenue. Uh, we can certainly dive into that more during the discussion if folks are interested. Next slide, please. From an expense point of view, over a third of this is true BPDA staff and associated benefits. In contractual services are the matching expenses for OWD grants, so they receive those funds and push them right back out to community-based organizations. FY23 is budgeted to see an increase in outside consulting, and that includes the contractual services category. We'll get more into those details in a moment. We are also seeing an increase for critical repairs in FY23 in the property management category. Next slide, please. So for revenue highlights here, uh, we will be seeing, uh, uh, we have been seeing great performance from our tenants and our parking lots and we anticipate there to be an increase there, 15% uh, increase in tenant revenue and a 38% increase in our parking budget. Based on our conversations with the real estate department, they've been a true partner in this work. The trends that we are seeing, we are budgeting two additional rent items in FY23. These are one-time transactions. Uh, we are also budgeting an increase in our equity participation revenue um, as it has been performing well over the last few years. Uh, next slide, please. For expenses, um, the BPDA is committed to filling out our workforce and hiring. For FY23, the personnel budget does include 39 vacant positions with 22 requests. You'll see we are also including investments for transformation with new leadership. Uh, we have come up with a few uh, budget for new leadership to drive trans uh, transformation, so that is included in here as well. For non-personnel expenses, it's important to note that OWD is doing extraordinary work to move funds out into the community, and their budget is showing that increase. 
uh, in grant funded expenses is six million dollar increase um, uh, that is the result of increased revenue the next slide please uh, to account for the BPDA's ongoing physician management needs, finance has been working with HR to provide the reports necessary to maintain our total headcount. We have been uh, leveraging a new database we've been referring to Airtable. Uh, it has helped us manage headcounts. We have a long way to go, but we're excited to share more and more data. Uh, it is clear that we um, have a lot of vacancies to fill. Um, next slide, please. So for our capital budget, we can skip one more over. The BPDA has a large list of capital construction projects that we talk about just about every time we meet. Our current focus is the already existing projects from last, the last few fiscal years that we will be rolling forward and the new projects that are on the top of the priority list for the capital construction team. Here is a breakdown of the new project for FY23. Uh, it's a combined total request of $15.8 million. The BRA will be continuing to update and upgrade the China Trade Center, and there are a large number of structural repair projects that are needed to be conducted in the Charlestown Navy Yard, and in Charlestown, um, we're working to extend the Little Mr. Carver Walk as well. The BRA FY23 new capital construction is projected to total FY13.4 uh, million. EDIC will be making some upgrades to 12 channels, reconstructing the jetty piers and a large project of Pier 10 for a passenger ferry terminal. The next slide, please. This concludes the presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Um, any uh, questions or comments from the board? I have a question, Madam Chair. Michelle, we on the revenue side, are we um, are we equal to a post, I mean, pre-COVID? So uh, I would say yes, we uh, recovered and then some. I think what we are um, very pleased to see is parking revenue um, has, has increased. I think we were kind of debating what the pandemic impact would be, and I think um, as folks are um, hybriding, um, it, it's actually prompting us to have a higher, higher utilization, or, sorry, higher earnings per spot. More employers are paying for parking, and so we're collecting more per spot. We're also noticing that our um, tenants happen to be in industries that weren't as hard hit as some others, and so anyone that was participating in our deferment program uh, has since recovered, and everybody has returned to their scheduled payments. Um, and so, yes, I would say from a revenue perspective, uh, we have recovered. There have been several one-time items that took place as well, um, but the reality is our, our one-time expenses still far exceed that. Um, so we are still monitoring our revenue closely. Did that address the question? Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Additional questions or comments? Well, like always, uh, Michelle, um, a very, um, you know, kudos to you and your team on a very, um, you know, concise and, and clear uh, picture of our um, of our budget um, and all the management that that you do to um, to assist and support the agency and all its work. So um, it's uh, a team effort. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but but it's uh, but it is a um, uh, just a, a great work a great work product. Um, very, very clean slides. You make it, you make our jobs easier. So, um, great. So, uh, with that, I believe a motion is in order. So moved. Second up. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Bill Ansmar. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, item number 16 personnel. Michael. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, to the uh, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Jemison. Uh, my name is Michael Kerr. Uh, I am the relatively new uh, Director of Human Resources uh, here at the agency. Um, so I look forward to uh, working with you in the, uh, in the coming uh, months and hopefully years. Um, we have a number of items for your consideration uh, on the EDC, EDIC agenda. Uh, we have 12 uh, appointments with details in the board memos. Uh, Emperor Phillips is crew leader, uh, Power Corps, Boston, 
in the Office of Workforce Development uh, with effective date of June 21st, 2022. Jeremy Thompson, Supportive Services Manager, Power Corps Boston in the Office of Workforce Development, effective June 21st, 2022. Uh, Trina Ruffin, Grants Manager in the Office of Workforce Development, effective June 21st, 2022. Linda Arian, Supportive Services Director, Power Corps uh, Boston in the Office of Workforce Development, effective June 27th, 2022. Cyrus Micelli, uh, Assistant Planner in the Planning Department, effective July 5th, 2022. Adriana Lasso Harrier, Planner One in the Planning Department, effective July 5th, 2022. Aline Michaud, Planner One in the Planning Department, effective July 5th, 2022. Anna Shear, Senior Program Manager in the Office of Workforce Development, effective July 5th, 2022. Tim Mathis, Deputy Director of Finance in the Budget and Finance Department, effective July 11th, 2022. Natalie Dedick, Real Estate Development Officer in the Real Estate Department, July 11th, effective July 11th, 2022. Camille Platt, Project Manager in the Development Review Department, effective July 25th, 2022. And Amina Scott, Deputy Controller in the Budget and Finance Department, effective July 11th, 2022. We also have uh, seven employment service contractors with details also listed in the board memos. Emily Weija in the MIS Department, Judy Steridi in the Finance Department, David Chen in the Office of Workforce Development, Lydia Sarufis in the Office of Workforce Development, Lock Trong in the Office of Workforce Development, Claire Shepard in the Office of Workforce Development, Irina Colin in the Office of Workforce Development. We have six salary adjustments in the, uh, with the specific details listed in the board memos. Uh, we also have five status changes with details listed in the board memos. Yaris Mia Cortez, Assistant to the Director of Planning in the Planning Department. Nisha McDonnell, Planning Assistant in the Planning Department. Emily Corist, Research Assistant in the Research Department. Peggy Hines Watson, Assistant Deputy Director in the Office of Workforce Development. Sue Chow, Administrative Assistant, one in the Office of Workforce Development. We have one travel request with the details listed in the board memos for Ronice Kimbrell, Asset Building Program Coordinator in the Office of Workforce Development. And finally, we have five departures with the details listed in the board memo. Anna Callahan, Planner 2 in the Planning Department. Zachary Connor, GIS Analyst in the MIS Department. Tao Luau, Senior Planning, Senior Planner, Image Boston 2030 in the Planning Department. Denise St. Vistel, Housing Compliance Assistant in the Compliance Department. And Yang Kun Chion, Research Assistant in the Research Department. Thank you and I'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you and welcome, Mr. Kerr. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Mr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The motion passes. Okay, thank you. All right, and with that, we have concluded our agenda for the EDIC. I uh, need a motion to adjourn this meeting. Uh, so moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Mr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Meeting adjourned. We'll now move over to the BPDA meeting. Thank you for joining the June Boston Redevelopment Authority Board meeting. At this time, the Boston Planning and Development Agency is continuing to host public meetings in a virtual setting for the health, safety, and accessibility of Boston residents. For more information and updates, visit bostonplans.org. 
The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Fios Channel 962. It's also being live streamed at boston.gov cable. We'll now take a roll call of the members to begin this meeting. Mr. Monaghan. Present. Dr. Lansmark. Present. Mr. Miller. Present. Okay, and I, Priscilla Rojas, am present. Great. First item on the agenda. Request authorization for the approval of the executive session minutes of the April 14th, 2022 meeting and for the approval of the executive session and regular session meeting session minutes of the May 12th, 2022 meeting. The motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. <clears throat> Item number two, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on July 14th, 2022 or at, at 530 or at such a time and date deemed appropriate by the director to consider the 125 Lincoln Street project as a development impact project. Uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number three, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on July 12, I'm sorry, July 14, 2022 at 5.40 p.m. or at such a time and date deemed appropriate by the director to consider the Seaport Circle project as a development impact project. The motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number four, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on July 14, 2022 at 5.50 p.m. or at such a time and date deemed appropriate by the director to consider the amended and restated master plan for plan development area number 115, Harvard Enterprise Cap Campus. To consider the phase A development plan for plan development area number 115, Enterprise Research Campus Project at 100 Western Avenue in Austin neighborhood, in the Austin neighborhood of Boston, and to consider the Phase A Enterprise Research Campus Project as a development impact project. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number five, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on July 14th, 2022 at, a, at 6 p.m. or at such a time and date deemed appropriate by the director to approve the third amendment to the second amended and restated development plan for 49, 51, and 63 Melcher Street with, within the master plan development area number 69, South Boston, um, the 100 acres. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Um, that's aye. Motion passes. Okay. Item number six, Board of Appeal. Brian. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, Director Jemison and Secretary Palhimas and members of the public. I'm Brian Glasscock, Deputy Director for Regulatory Planning and Zoning for the BPDA. Uh, in your packet, you should have recommendations on 57 zoning petitions that have been prepared by the agency staff for transmittal to the Board of Appeal, and we're seeking your approval to transmit them. Okay, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and saying none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for the vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. <coughs> Aye. Okay. Uh, Mr. Miller? Aye. And the check with I motion passes. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. All right. Item number seven, request authorization to enter into a license agreement with New Atlantic Development Incorporated for the temporary use of a portion of three vacant lots, commonly referred to as the Blair lot, to display an exterior building construction prototype and maintain three storage containers to support the development project located at 2147 Washington Street in Roxbury. Lauren. Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, the BPDA owns a certain land in Nubian Square, commonly known as the Blair Lot. Nubian Ascends Partners LLC was tentatively designated as redeveloper of the Blair Lot in December 2020 after an extensive community process. The Blair Lot is one of nine publicly owned 
vacant developable properties in the Nubian Square area of Roxbury that comprise Plan Nubian Square. 2147 Washington Street is a partnership of New Atlantic Development LLC and Dream Collaborative and is a Mayor's Office of Housing sponsored affordable housing project. The building will be a mixed use development with cafe restaurant space for the Haley House Bakery Cafe. The license area is within the Blair lot and it shall be used exclusively to display an exterior building construction prototype pertaining to the redevelopment of 2147 in Washington. New Atlantic at its own cost of expense agrees to maintain the licensed premises in a clean, safe and orderly condition and repair. New Atlantic will also carry for the term of the license, comprehensive public liability insurance indemnifying the BRA against all claims and demands for personal injury and property damage. The license term shall begin July 1st, 2022 and expire on June 30th, 2023. One six month extension is permissible at the discretion of the BPDA director. Due to the affordable housing component of the development and the significant public subsidy required, no fee is proposed for the use of the license premises. By agreeing not to charge a market fee, BPDA will forego approximately $150,000 in revenue during the initial term. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? This lot has um, been used in recent years for a number of uh, public community purposes. Will um, putting in this um, uh, display and the uh, containers eliminate those public uses on this lot? Uh, absolutely not. So the uh, lot has been divided into several subsections. Um, the events are taking place on the paved lot. The dirt lot is reserved for New Vita Sands development. And across the street, there's a small section of um, lawn, which is a part of the parcel, but isn't directly connected. This is where the uh, mock-up will go for now, and it won't be anywhere near um, any of the events. Thank you. You're welcome. Any additional questions or comments? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Okay, before we take the next uh, agenda item, um, we have a, a member from Councilor Arroyo's office um, who would like to testify on a few of the projects before us tonight. So uh, Jordan, if you are on, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening, members of the board, Madam Chair. My name is Jordan Frias, as uh, the chair said, uh, Councilor Arroyo's chief of staff. I just want to go on the record that our office is in support of the several projects I'm going to name right now. 7 Dana Avenue in Hyde Park, 59 to 63 Belgrade Avenue, Rosendale, 635 Hyde Park Avenue in Rosendale, and 1525 Blue Hill Avenue uh, in Mattapan. I just want to state for the record for um, the 1525 Blue Hill Avenue project in Mattapan, we did speak with the proponent, Dimitri Hetion who said that he is committed to exploring best practices to address issues of condo fee affordability, including setting an initial sales price that incorporates a buffer, buffer for condo fees, requiring that HOA fees are lower for IDP units, and putting in place an IDP unit owner, putting in place protections if the IDP owner fails, falls behind the HOA fees. So I just wanted to make sure that we had those on the record as in support with those constituencies, uh, and also that all these projects are within uh, 19 to 20% affordable, which we also support. So again, we just want to support those several projects and here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, um, I think that's good. Thank you so much, Jordan. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, cheers. All right, um, let's move on to item number eight. Request authorization to amend license agreements with Gun Clock Dance, Chinatown Main Streets, and the Chinatown Historical Society for office space in the basement level of the China Trade Building, located at 2 Boylton Street in Chinatown. Lauren. Thank you. 2 Boylton Street, also known as the China Trade Building, is a designated Boston landmark serving as a symbol of the city of Boston's commitment to revitalize Boston's Midtown and Chinatown area. In 2014, a large portion of the building became vacant when the Commonwealth of Massachusetts vacated five entire floors. Currently, over 90% of the building has been leased at market rates. And since the 1990s, several not-for-profit agencies located within the China trade 
have provided the community with cultural and historical resources and have facilitated connectivity to the greater Chinatown businesses. Gun Kwok is the only Asian female lion and dragon dance troupe in the United States. It was established in February of 1998 to give Asian women an opportunity to express their creativity, power, and strength through performing the lion and dragon dances. Gun Kwok utilizes 855 square feet in suite G5. The China Shrine Main Streets program supports the neighborhood community by backing local businesses, establishing new opportunities, and maintaining old traditions. Chinatown Main Streets utilizes 880 square feet in Unit G2. Chinese Historical Society of New England is a nonprofit entity incorporated in Massachusetts in 1992. It's the first educational organization dedicated solely to documenting, preserving, and promoting the history and legacy of Chinese immigration in New England. The Historical Society utilizes 430 square feet in Suite G3. These organizations have an established presence in the China Trade Building and are integral to the culture of life in Chinatown. As nonprofits, however, they operated on a limited budget. In recognition of the service provided to the neighborhood by these licensees, the board voted at the August 15, 2019 board meeting to provide certain space in the building to these agencies without assessing a license fee. Today, I'm here to ask that the BPDA authorize the director to amend each of these license agreements through July 31st, 2027. By agreeing not to charge a market fee, BPDA will forego collectively approximately 44,000 during the first year and a total effective forbearance of approximately $250,000 during the five-year term. I'm happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and saying none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. 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 Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Okay, item number nine. Request authorization to amend the license agreement with preservation of affordable housing LLC for the use of land located on parcel P3 in the campus high school urban renewal area for construction staging to support the Whittier phase three affordable housing development. Come on. Thank you. Yeah. The BPDA owns approximately 25,000 square feet of land within the P3 development parcel and the campus high school urban renewal area and immediate adjacent to the Madison Park fields and the parking lot of the Good Shepherd Church of God. The parcel has been utilized by preservation of affordable housing LLC and other appropriate development partners for material laydown, storage trailers and a field office trailers for the past two years to support phase two of their development. The Way Your Choice Neighborhoods Initiative, a, collect, a collaboration between POA, Northeast Interior's General Contractor, Madison Park Development Corporation, and the Boston Housing Authority, is redeveloping the Whittier Streets apartment site on Tremont in Roxbury. The Commonwealth's Department of Housing and Community Development is supporting the development with federal and state low-income housing tax credit and subsidy funds. In addition, the city of Boston supports the project with local funding for affordable housing creation and preservation. Whittier phase three commencement has necessitated the need for an additional 5,000 square feet of the parcel P3 for construction laydown and logistics for a new total of 30,000 square feet as the licensed premises. In 2024, once all three phases are completed, the redevelopment will have replaced 200 public housing rental apartments with 210 deeply affordable units and created 262 additional units of mixed income rental housing and 14,000 square feet of commercial space. This amendment includes an extension of the term for one year and will not extend beyond June 30th, 2023 without approval and further forward action from the BPDA. Due to the affordable housing component of the development and significant public subsidy required, no fee is proposed for the use of the licensed premises. By agreeing not to charge a market fee, BPDA will forego approximately 300,000 in revenue during the term. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and saying none, a motion is in order. 
So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. All right. Item number 10, request authorization to award an engineering service contract to Ray Gunnett's Landscape Architecture, Inc. for engineering design services for the Chelsea Historic Chelsea Street Historic Fence Rehabilitation Project in the Charlestown Navy Yard in an amount not to exceed $81,047. William. Hello again, Madam Chair, members of the board. This matter was last before you at the December 21 board meeting to request authorization to solicit qualifications and fee for this work. As you will likely recall, the fencing along Chelsea Street runs about 1,500 feet and is part of the Navy Yard's historic monument area governed by the National Park Service. It is constructed of iron fence panels supported by intermediate masonry columns. Both the iron fencing components and the masonry columns are in critical condition and in need of repair and restoration to prevent failure and loss. The engineering contract will develop design alternatives, secure all necessary permitting and prepare construction bid documents to repair and restore uh, this historic Navy Yard fence. Plans and specifications will be prepared in accordance with Chapter 3039M of the Massachusetts General Laws. The contract would include permitting, bidding assistance, resident engineering services, and construction administration. The agency issued a formal request for proposals in accordance with the agency's designer selection policy on April 4th of this year. The process included outreach to 30 or included outreach to E and WB firms and it resulted in 31 interested parties downloading our solicitation. However, only one firm uh, submitted a response as Ray Dunnett's landscape architecture. Um, they submitted their response on the 20th in accordance with the requirements of the solicitation. A designer select committee was assembled to review that qualification package and based on that review, the committee for the qualifications of Ray Dunnett's to be highly advantageous and unanimously recommends award of the engineering contract. Uh, this firm has significant experience with this type of historic fence restoration um, done work both within the city of Boston for the city of Boston, as well as other towns and municipalities in your Boston area. The total contract award is for $81,047. It's been appropriately budgeted for in the agency's fiscal year 22 capital budget. Uh, therefore, we are requesting that the director be authorized to enter into this contract with Ray Dennis on St. Architecture. Uh, one final comment following Mr. Miller's question uh, at the previous meeting uh, regarding uh, the low number of responses. We received no constructive criticism from the parties who downloaded the solicitation. This is yet another situation where the engineers have uh, ample work before them and they're being quite selective. Um, that said, we are very confident with this particular uh, response and we're happy to move forward pending your approval. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? Madam Chair, one question. William, is it over budget? Uh, it is not over budget. No, in fact, I'm very happy with this uh, fee proposal. Thank you. We'll, we'll see how the work comes in once it's all designed. We've got to move it into construction. But right now, we're, we're very happy. Okay, great. Great news. All right, with that, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, item number 11, request authorization to award three-year contracts for general repairs and maintenance services on an as-needed basis for BRA-owned properties to AACK Marine and General Contracting, LLC, D'Alessandro Corp, Fleming Brothers, Inc., uh, June Enterprises, Inc., Sanibel Electric Corp., and Scott's Industrial and Commercial Painting, Inc., in an amount not to exceed $800,000 annually. Laura. Thank you again, Madam Chair and members of the board. To follow up on the earlier vote on the EDIC portion of the agenda, and as stated as the, in the preamble, I'm requesting authorization to award a package of as-needed contracts for general repair and maintenance services at BPDA properties. The details are the same as those presented earlier today, but I'm happy to provide any additional information that might be helpful, and thank you once again. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number 12, request authorization to extend the tentative designation of Tentative Development Corporation as redeveloper for the development on parcel U2A located at 151 Lenox Street in the South End Urban Renewal Area. Right. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, Director Jemison, Madam Secretary, and members of the board. I'm requesting an additional nine month, month extension to the tentative designation for Tenants Development Corporation of Roxbury, TDC, for the redevelopment of this BPDA owned parcel. The board originally voted to award TDC tentative designation in June 2018 and has extended the tentative designation at boards in 2019, 2020, and most recently in December of 2021. As you recall, TDC is proposing to develop a community center, including office space for its headquarters. The total development cost of the project is approximately $9 million, financed by new market tax credits, a conventional construction loan, and a capital campaign of just under $4 million. As previously reported, TDC has raised approximately $947,000 of the total $3.9 million current capital campaign. TDC is awaiting hearing from the new Commonwealth Racial Action equity and social justice fund for consideration for the organization's round of major gifts that will deploy um, in the spring of 2022. These gifts will range from 50,000 to 250,000. TDC is also awaiting hearing on their recent $2.3 million grant application to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for funding that is sourced through the Federal American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, ARPA, uh, funds for which the state is soliciting applications from community-based organizations. If TDC re receives this funding in full, the capital campaign for the community center will be fulfilled. This would enable them to finalize the remainder of their financing and move towards finalizing constru construction drawings and into the zoning and approvals process. And I did uh, email them earlier today. I was hoping they would have some news on one of these, but they, they haven't heard as of yet. So hopefully they'll be hearing uh, any day now. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions from the board? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Uh, roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Lampner. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. All right, item number 13, request authorization to extend the tentative designation status of Drexel Village LLC as redeveloper for the Crescent Parcel Project in the Nubian Square area of Roxbury. Rebecca. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. We are requesting board approval to extend the tentative designation of Drexel Village LLC for the development and long-term lease of the Crescent Parcel in the Nubian Square area of Roxbury. The Crescent Parcel is approximately 73,000 square feet um, comprised of eight parcels of vacant land, two owned by the BPDA, three owned by MassDOT, and three owned by the City of Austin. The property is located in both the Campus High School and the South End Urban Renewal areas. The BPDA released a request for proposals for the redevelopment of Crescent Parcel in January 2021. The RFP com contemplated a mixed-use development consisting of residential housing with ground floor commercial or retail use. On November 18th, 2021, the BPDA board voted to approve the tentative designation of Drexel Village for the redevelopment of the Crescent Parcel. The development team proposes a 313,000 square foot development with 206 rental units and 11 home ownership units with 31,000 square feet of community space for the social services agencies currently located at, on the Crescent Parcel and parish space for the St. Catherine Drexel Church. The proposed development will also include improvements to the abutting parcel owned by the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Boston. Since being granted tentative designation, the development team has made significant progress, including conducting environmental site assessment and hazardous material survey of the property, completing initial titles and survey work on the Crescent and Archdiocese parcels, engaging in conversations with MassDOT on the valuation of MassDOT controlled parcels, and presenting at six pre-file meetings with the BPDA and city staff to collect feedback and make design revisions. During the requested six-month extension, the development team plans to complete the Article 80 and Article 37 processes, as well as design review with the BPDA and Mayor's Office of Housing. Drexel Village will also negotiate the terms and conditions of the ground lease with the BPDA. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Given uh, some changing uh, financial uh, conditions in the world at large, is six months going to be enough time? Um, so we have decided to move forth with six months, given our relationship with MassDOT. They'd like to see um, the team back to the board in um, making significant progress under that time. So I don't believe that six months will lead to the completion of all of those steps, but I think we'll get very close and we'll show progress for MassDOT. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. 
So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Mr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number 14, request authorization to extend the tentative designation status of Nuveen Ascend Partners, LLC, as redeveloper of five BRA-owned parcels, also known as the Blair Lot, in the Nuveen Square area of Roxbury. Jonathan. Thank you, Madam Chair, Director Jameson, Madam Secretary, and members of the board. I'm here today to request a six-month extension to the tentative designation for Nubian Ascend Partners, LLC, which is intended for the redevelopment of five parcels owned by the BPDA, known as the Bear Lot, and to request a recommendation of approval to the Zoning Board of Appeals on behalf of four filings seeking zoning relief necessary for the construction of Nubian Ascend's protected project. As you may recall, the board originally voted to award Nubian Ascend tentative designation on December 17th, 2020, and extended that tentative designation at the board meeting on December 16th, 2021. New Medina Sin is proposing to create approximately 365,475 gross square feet of new mixed use space, which will include 15 home ownership units, retail space, uh, commercial, office and laboratory space, entertainment and artistic cultural space, a publicly accessible pedestrian corridor, and a 300 space above grade parking garage. The total development cost of this project is approximately $118,197,689. Since the last extension, New Medina Sense has made significant progress towards final designation. Some of the milestones they have achieved in this process include securing pre-construction financing totaling $7,950,000 from sponsors, private investors, donations, and awards from the Massachusetts Housing Investment, Blue, Blue Hub, and other partners. They have also received $1 million, I mean $1,500,000 from Mass Development and $1,080,000 from the Mayor's Office of Housing for Artist Housing and has a pending application for funding with math with mass life sciences. They have made progress towards meeting their goal of 60% pre-leasing by partnering with the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology to establish a Nubian Square Life Science Training Center. They have completed ground lease negotiations with the BPDA and are working towards executing the final ground lease. Lastly, they have filed appeals with the Zoning Board of Appeals seeking the zoning relief necessary to begin construction on the proposed project. During this requested tentative designation extension, the developers will pursue approvals at the Zoning Board of Appeals and Boston Landmarks Commission and will apply for additional funding with MassWorks, Mass Housing, and the Community Preservation Act. With that being said, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item number 15. Request authorization to extend the tentative designation status of Jackson Square Partners, LLC, for the affordable housing products, projects located on parcels of land owned by the City of Boston, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts acting by and through the Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance in Roxbury and Jamaica Plain. Dana. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison and Secretary Pohemus. I'm Dana Whiteside, Deputy Chief of Staff and Senior Development Advisor. We're pleased to share with you this request for consideration of the extension of the tentative designation for Jackson Square Partners as developer of the land sites referenced by uh, Madam Chair in Jamaica Plain and Roxbury. As part of this request, a brief update about the status of the overall Jackson Square development, key items completed, and upcoming milestones. By way of reminder, Jackson Square Partners is comprised of Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Development Corporation, Urban Edge, High Square Task Force, and the Community Builders. The designation of Jackson Square Partners has been in place since May of 2005 and reflects a memorandum of agreement between the development parties and the state agencies which have land ownership interests. As part of the overall Jackson Square development writ large, the projects that have been completed or will, will be in construction in 2022 represent a total of approximately 333 total new homes, uh, including approximately 211 income-restricted units and approximately 122 market rate homes. 
Throughout the life of the designation, Jack's Square Partners have had the responsibility of completing various transactions and milestones, which have included land assembly, completion of land transfer, and securing of financing. Significant components of the development which have com been completed in recent years include 225 Centre Street, Jackson Commons, and uh, 75 Amory Street. The Jackson Square development was also a successful recipient of MassWorks grant from the Commonwealth's Executive Office of Housing and Community Development. This grant has funded important public realm and infrastructure enhancements supporting the affordable housing creation and including new pedestrian streetscape and relocation of utilities. Projects within the Jackson Square development which have reached significant milestones include both completion as well as occupation such as 25 Amory Street with a total of approximately 44 all income restricted units at 60% AMI, as well as the beginning of construction for 250 Center Street, which will result in the creation of approximately 110 mixed income housing units, as well as approximately 2,400 square feet of commercial space. Again, the majority of those units of housing will be income restricted. One further project which will commence its Article 80 process in the year 2022 will include the 1550 Columbus Ave, which is currently in concept phase, but, but again will be, be beginning its process of looking through the Article 80 process. Further areas of success and items completed by the partnership in the last year have included conveyance of public land, clarifying evidence of viable financing plan for the development, as well as completion of important infrastructure enhancements recently mentioned. Final designation requirements include, again, the completion of the construction of 250 Center Street, as well as work to be undertaken for the 1550 Columbus Avenue project during this current year. But that concludes my remarks. I'll also acknowledge the presence today of Emily Lewis, Director of Real Estate for Urban Edge, David Aiken, Senior Project Manager for the Community Builders, and Lena Jimenez, Senior Project Man Manager with Jamaica Community PC. And I am also happy to take any questions you might have on the information. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Dana. Thanks very much. All right. <clears throat> Item number 16. Request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the residential building known as the residences at Forest Hills, located at 3694 Washington Street in Jamaica Plain. Uh, motion is in order. So moved. Yep. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 17. Request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the residential building known as Waterside Place, Phase 1B, located at 501 Congress Street in the South Boston Waterfront. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Mr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 18, request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the residential building located at 217 Albany Street in the South End Urban Renewal Area. A motion is in order. So moved. Uh, aye. <laughs> no, so, so moved. moved. <laughs> okay. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. <clears throat> Item number 19. Request authorization to adopt a minor modification to the Charlestown Renewal Area Project Number Mass R-55 with respect to Parcel R-30 and to enter into an amended and restated land disposition agreement with 28 Monument Square Trust for the new property that will be located at 28 Monument Square. Chris. Chris, you're muted. Chris, I think you're still muted. Oh, working now. How about now? 
Yeah. Sorry. Let me start that over. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hamos, Director Jenis Jemison, I am Chris Breen, Urban Renewal Manager. Still muted? Can you guys hear me? You're good, Chris. Continue. Okay. <laughs> For you is a minor modification resolution to effectuate the redevelopment of parcel R30, a 2,837 square foot lot located at 28 Monument Square in Charlestown. Uh, the project proposed is a four-story single-family home replacing the parking lot that had resided at the corner of Monument Square for the past 40 years. The project went through an extensive community process before receiving its relief from the Zoning Board of Appeals and received support from the Mayor's Office, the District City Council, and members of the community. Although residential uses are allowed on the site via the Urban Renewal Plan, a modification was necessary primarily to allow for increased building height, particularly 55 and a half feet in this case, to match the roof lines of the abutting row houses, which was a request of the Trout Sound Preservation Society and other members of the community. Density and other building uh, requirement changes were needed to match the project zoning. Uh, the amended LDA will restrict the property to single family use. Uh, there has been a delay, slight delay in construction of the project due to the increased building costs due to the pandemic, but they have prepared to move on, so they are seeking a vote um, as they also seek an extension of their ZBA um, compliance variances. So let me know if you have any questions. And sorry about my computer malfunction. No worries, no worries. Um, <clears throat> any questions or comments from the board? Right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So move. Second. Um, we'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Mr. Lance Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Item number 20. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval in of 16 home ownership units, including three IDP units, ground floor healthcare service commercial space and nine surface level parking spaces located at 1525 Blue Hill Avenue and to take all related actions. Ted. Thank you, Madam. Chair and members of the board, the proposal before you is an Article 80 small project at 1525 Blue Hill Ave in Mattapan. The proposed project consists of new, a new five story mixed use building. The commercial space will house the existing family run mental health service provider on the ground floor level while providing 16 residential condo units, nine surface parking spaces and bike storage. The project will deliver 19% of the proposed residential units at 80 to 100% AMI. Furthermore, the BPDA held two public meetings for this project in April and May of 2022. These were both well attended and advertised in the local newspaper. Now, I will turn it over to Kathleen Onifer from EPA Planning to discuss the planning context before Cheryl Tagayas and D Dimitri Piton from the development team begin the presentation. Lastly, I wanna thank you, the members of the public elected officials and city agencies who helped review the proposed 1525 Blue Hill Lab project. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Roja, Secretary Pohemus, and members of the board. My name is Kathleen Onifer, and I'm the Assistant Deputy Director for Downtown Neighborhood Planning. Um, I'm here tonight presenting on this project and also many others because the Mattapan Neighborhood Planner is at a community planning meeting right now in Mattapan, and our Dorchester Planner is out on Dartmouth Street at the Copley Connect um, efforts. So we have a lot of active planning and community engagement going on this evening. The proposed project um, here, 1525 Blue Hill Avenue, is located within the boundaries of the ongoing plan Mattapan process led by our planning division here in collaboration with the community and other city and state agencies. Since the start of the plan Mattapan planning process in 2018, the BPDA has identified a unifying vision, which includes supporting the creation of new housing that is affordable to the residents of Mattapan, creating opportunities for local businesses to thrive, and enhancing connections to improve the neighborhood um, jobs and spaces where people gather together as an experience. Currently, the planning team is writing draft recommendations for both Blue Hill Avenue and Mattapan Square. Both of these draft recommendations would allow for greater height and density in exchange for key community benefits. Uh, the draft recommendations also require that projects along the Blue Hill Avenue corridor maintain an active ground floor use, um, improved green space and streetscape to enliven the public realm, 
and increase the supply and diversity of affordable and accessible housing options. Finally, projects should support a mix of transportation modes and better connect to the neighborhood. The proposed project is consistent with these draft recommendations. In addition, the project team worked extensively with planning staff to preserve a mature tree on the site and respond to the surrounding low density residential context through step backs. I'll now turn it over to the proponent team. Uh, good afternoon, um, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Cheryl Tugayas, and I am a principal with Spalding Tugayas Architects based in Boston. I am here on behalf of the owner of the property, property Mr. Dimitri Petion, and uh, Mr. Petion will be available uh, for questions um, when I conclude uh, the presentation for us. Um, this um, site location has been described, but you can also see the um, peak dash line um, rectangle at the lower right of the screen, and you can see this uh, project is uh, located in close proximity to uh, Mattapan Square and the Blue Hill uh, Avenue commuter rail station. And uh, while it's shown here as the Mattapan Greater Boston Technology Site, that is where the Cody Ford uh, development is uh, now uh, nearing completion. Our proposed project, as has been mentioned, is 16 residential units on four floors above the first floor commercial space. There will be three of those units will be affordable IDP units. Uh, those uh, will consist of two two-bedroom and one one-bedroom, I'm sorry, one one-bedroom, one two-bedroom, and two two-bedroom affordable units. Sorry about that. Uh, the the uh, total mix of units will be uh, four three-bedroom, four two-bedroom, and eight one-bedroom units. The uh, total square footage is just under 22,000 square feet. It's a five-story building, as has been said. That height is 58 feet, and also nine surface parking spaces. Next slide, please. This shows um, the greater context as well. This time, the site is located within a pink circle in the middle of the slide. There's two bus lines on Blue Hill Avenue that serve this location, number 28 and number 29, uh, that lead to Mattapan Square, which has access to the trolley. And as I mentioned before, there's uh, immediate access to the commuter rail. This site has a very uh, high transit score and a high walk score and bike score as well. It's in close proximity to uh, parks and playgrounds and the open space uh, along the ponds at River Trail. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see the parcel. It is currently has the white structure in the middle of the slide with the site notation. It's at the intersection of Regis Road and Blue Hill Avenue. Next, please. The, the photo on the left is from the rear. Uh, Chester Park abuts the property. It's a small roadway. Uh, that will not be used for the access to this parcel, uh, but we wanted to give you an idea of what that rear of the property looked like. Regis Road, which would be the vehicle access to the property, is uh, the photo on the right. And you can see the site noted uh, on the left side of that photograph. Next, please. It's already been mentioned some of the uh, planning context that the BPDA has undergone. Uh, we also reviewed the planning that the BTD is doing for improvements to Blue Hill Ave as well as planning uh, that DND has been doing uh, on Blue Hill Ave. As far as transportation, we understand that there uh, may be some uh, changes uh, directly in front of this parcel. That would be the elimination of curbside parking and the addition of a bike lane. Our vehicle access, as I mentioned, would come from Regis Road, so that would not interfere with any uh, proposed changes or, that are being considered currently. That plan also um, notes a desire for more trees and greenery. And um, it's been said that we are preserving a tree as part of this development that would facilitate that. As far as D&D, &D, um, the promotion of housing in combination with commercial is something that we are proposing here and it is consistent with D&D uh, &D actions as well. Next slide. This is the ground floor slash site site plan. You can see the existing tree, the large green circle uh, that is being preserved. That will serve as a forecourt to the residential entry to the building, which is uh, next to it on the left. The uh, commercial space, which will house the uh, mental health services provider that Mr. 
uh, Pat Jones family provides. It will be there in the blue as well as on the floor below, partial basement space. We've increased the uh, sidewalk on both Blue Hill Avenue and on Regis Road, uh, three feet for Blue Hill App and two feet for Regis. You can see the, we will be closing one of two curb cuts and there will be one curb cut now on Regis Road uh, to provide access to the nine parking spaces. Next slide, please. Uh, provides an aerial view showing the uh, proposed building in context. Um, I mentioned the Cody Ford site development that's in the upper left. And um, you can see some of the scale of the surrounding properties as they exist today. Next. This is a elevation of Blue Hill Avenue. So showing the building um, in scale uh, in relationship to the properties uh, adjacent to it. Next slide, please and a rendered view uh, showing the building um, in its context. And lastly, a, a recap slide, I believe. So the 16 units, three IDP, uh, in, in addition to the six clinicians and one director that will continue to be employed here, I wanted to note that this um, Provide, that they provide 11,000 patient visits per year, which is a, a, a large community benefit uh, that the family has provided uh, for many decades now. In addition, 30 construction jobs um, will be provided through the construction of the project. Uh, and lastly, uh, I want to mention, uh, you can see the transit I mentioned already, but the, uh, on the sustainability front, we, are, we have a goal of net zero carbon uh, and we are going to engage uh, with Mass Save to do a passive house feasibility study to help us achieve that goal. We'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the board? All right, looks like a great project and really excited to, um, you know, to see and hear that we are preserving um, the healthcare services resource on um, on the ground floor. That's, uh, that's critical to uh, to our community. So, thank, you. thank you. Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank All you. Right. Thanks. Item number 21. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review in the Zoning Code for the construction of 27 residential units, including five IDP units, 27 off-street stacked parking spaces, and 34 bicycle parking spaces located at 7 Dana Avenue and to take all related actions. Uh, the team presenting will be Caitlin and Anhill. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Polhemus and Director Jemison, Caitlin Coppinger, Project Manager and Development Review. The proposal before you today is a, an Article 80 small project review located at 7 Dana Ave in High Park. The proposed project is a four-story, 27-unit building consisting of 18 one-bedroom units and nine two-bedroom units. The proponent is committed to a 19% IDP contribution resulting in five IDP units. The project is providing 27 stack vehicular parking spaces, 34 bike parking spaces. The BPDA held two public meetings that were well attended. Uh, I'm now happy to turn it over to Angel Desmond, the High Park Neighborhood Planner, to discuss the planning project, the planning context. Thank you, Caitlin. Good evening, Chair Rojas, Secretary Polimas, and mem members of the board. My name is Angel Guzman, and I am a neighborhood planner covering Hyde Park. The proposed project is located adjacent to the Hyde Park Commuter Rail Station in the Cleary and Logan Square Neighborhood Shopping Subdistrict. Zoning for the area was adopted in 2011 following the Hyde Park planning and rezoning process initiated in 2008. The key considerations of BPDA staff during the review of the proposed project include mitigating the impact of ground floor parking in a neighborhood shopping district, creating a wider sidewalk to support residents at this site and transit users, finding a balance between neighborhood parking quantity desires and city climate and transportation goals, and ensuring ample bicycle parking spaces and bicycle access as required by the city's bike parking guidelines issued in 2021. Thank you for your time. 
And I will now pass the presentation over to the proponent team. Hi, good evening. Peter Vanco, architect on the project of Vanco Studio Architects. Um, we, thank you for your time this evening. We are pleased to present uh, an exciting infill project, uh, an, an activation project that's going to help further this neighborhood and bring it into uh, delivering much needed housing. Um, and we believe in a very uh, uh, sensitive way and a positive move for the city. Um, the yellow rectangle there on your screen is the project location. To the left, there's a building that I'm going to be referring to frequently, and that is 11 Dana. And 11 Dana is really our sister building. Uh, the building we are proposing is of similar massing, similar scale, essentially the same height. It's more or less the same building, um, just to the right. right. Next slide, please. Existing conditions, uh, we have an anomalous lot. Uh, you can see there is a small, um, small building that is remnant from certain, um, certainly this was a neighborhood of a different scale in, in past ages, but it is changing. Uh, the building to our left, again, 11 Dana, that is really where the, the neighborhood, the site um, in this area is going, uh, but the site that we are currently working on uh, is a remnant structure. So there is a, there is a demolition uh, happening on that site, but um, more or less you will see that the building that we're proposing is going to be in similar scale and size one to our left. Next slide. As mentioned, uh, 27 units, 12 of those are one beds, six are one bed plus den, and nine are two bedroom units. Total of 27 parking spaces. 34 bike parking spaces, and as stated here on the top of this slide, we're almost 36,000 square feet gross. Next slide, please. Dana Avenue on all of these subsequent plans will be on the far right of the slide. This is a composite of our first floor, um, the plantings that are on the, uh, at the site plan, um, and also our roof. Essentially, our footprint there is the darkest portion of the slide. Uh, we have, as mentioned, spent a lot of time with BPDA staff and planners to provide a more generous sidewalk. Uh, the front yard setback that we have here um, accepts actually the public crossing over onto our property line. Uh, a wider, more generous parking, um, uh, rather bike parking area even out in front of our building. Um, we're trying to set the stage for large amounts of pedestrians crossing by this building. And, and in this case, uh, they would be moving plan north to get to the park or to the uh, trans station. So uh, what's fortunate here is that despite the size of the building, we still have found ways to provide a lot of green. Um, there's going to be a lot of plantings that are present. Um, we think we've done a good job of greening the site despite the size of the building. And that large building that was in the aerial views prior, 11 Dana that I was talking about, that is planned south in these diagrams. You can see it's of a similar scale and size filling that lot as well, of which we would be essentially aligning to that. Next slide, please. Um, we did a complete street study with our landscape architect. I won't belabor this too much, but that certainly contributed to our walkability score. Next slide, please. Here's our building. This is what we are proposing. Similar massing and scale to 11 Dana, which is to our left. Um, intention is that it is essentially a four-story massing with a parking garage below um, under the first floor. Next slide, please. That four stories, um, it's really three stories of living space above grade. Uh, we have a pedestrian entry, our primary entries announced by the canopies. Those are really just um, receiving lobbies. Uh, from that point, you'll see as the plans get a little clearer, 
that we have uh, stacked parking within. So there really is not occupied space on that first floor. It's really just at the lobby level. But three identical levels of, of living space above. We worked closely with BPA staff um, in, in design review to achieve this. Um, what we believe is, is a sensible but still exciting move for this, uh, for this street. Next slide, please. This is the other side, uh, 11 Dana. Our sister building is to the left in this view. You can see there's a little bit of dialogue with some balconies that happen between those two buildings. Whereas on the opposite side, there was also balconies, but they were instead uh, with an attempt to be respectful to the neighbor uh, on that right-hand side. Let, next slide, please. Again, uh, 27 units, 19% of those are IDP units. Uh, right next to the commuter rail station, 300 foot walk to there, and we have a 77 walk score. With that, excited for any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. <clears throat> we have a roll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you and congratulations. Great project. Thank you. Have a good evening. Cheers. All right. Item number 22 <clears throat> Request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 31 residential units, including six IDP units, 23 off-street parking spaces, and 31 bicycle parking spaces located at uh, 59 through 63 Belgrade Avenue, and to take all related actions. Uh, Caitlin and Kathleen. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Again, Caitlin Coppinger, Project Manager in Development Review. Uh, we have 59 Belgrade in Roslindale. This project proposes to raise the existing funeral home in order to construct their four-story, 31-unit residential project. It includes 15 one-bedroom units and 16 two-bedroom units with the uh, inclusion of six IDP units resulting in a 19% contribution. Um, and again, the project will include 23 parking spaces and 31 bicycle park spaces. The proponent has also agreed to implement some transportation measures on Pinehurst and Belgrade Ave to improve the pedestrian safety along this street, including curb extensions and the addition of two crosswalks. Overall, we believe this project and its mitigation package will further add to the development of Rossville Square in a beneficial way. I'm happy to turn it over to Kathleen Onifer and the planning team to discuss the planning context and then to Jason Arndt from the development team to give their presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair and the members of the board. The, this proposed project is within the boundaries of the Roslindale Neighborhood Strategic Plan, which was adopted in 20, 2007. This plan highlights three key themes, that projects should provide a wide range of housing units and, and options, including unit sizes, building types, and pricing for new and existing residents, to continue to support Roslindale Square as a vibrant commercial district, and provide improved transportation options, including transit, pedestrian, bicycle, and automobile accommodation. The proposed project meets the spirit of these planning principles and vision. It is in a dense residential development near transit corridors with a mix of unit sizes and types that supports the Roslindale Square Main Streets District. While the planning team has used the Roslindale Village Strategic Plan as a reference in this review, they've also utilized other more recent plans, such as Imagine Boston 2030 and Go Boston 2030 um, and the surrounding neighborhood context to evaluate the project. I'll now turn it over to the proponent team. Hi, um, Madam Chair, members, uh, members of the board, um, thank you for your time. My name is Jason Arndt. I'm the architect um, with several architects. Uh, I will uh, make this brief and talk about some of the, the uh, design ideas and implemented in this project. Um, this is a, uh, a rendering of the project looking from Belgrade Avenue at the main entrance, and I'll go over this a little bit more later. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the current location is occupied by a funeral home that will be raised um, and uh, um, uh, will be occupied by the new building. Uh, next slide, please. 
The overall, this is an overall aerial context with um, 5963 Belgrade located at the bottom of the uh, aerial there. Uh, we have El Belgrade Avenue on the right side and a, um, the commuter rail on the left side with uh, Rosendale Village Commuter Rail Station, uh, just a stone throws right just above. And you can see Adams Park and Rosendale Square very close within walking context. Um, we took that into consideration whenever we were designing the building, in addition to um, some of the uh, amenities that we provided um, uh, for the residents, um, in addition to communication with the uh, neighborhood uh, committees and local residents. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a overlay of the existing building in light gray with a new building in a dark uh, black. We are, in, uh, in this particular instance, we are removing um, a number of violations that the uh, current building has as far as uh, zoning setbacks. We'll be providing a 10-front uh, uh, green buffer zone on Belgrade Avenue. Um, there is currently two curb cuts. We'll only be utilizing one of the curb cuts, um, giving parking back to the street. Uh, the second curb cut we will be using in addition to a large sloping of the grade to provide uh, basically below grade parking um, of 23 spaces. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the ground floor plan. Uh, the uh, Belgrade Avenue is located on the uh, lower part of the plan. Um, we will be implementing 31 parking spaces with direct access to um, to the entrance. Um, this is high priority for a, a number of neighbors um, in a uh, commuter-based uh, neighborhood like Rosendale and Rosendale Square. Uh, this uh, plan shows a basic organization for the layout above with, um, uh, as mentioned before, 16 two-bedroom units and 15 one-bedroom units. Um, a very similar configuration for the three floors above, uh, minus the parking space. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a perspective of elevation looking at the building um, from across Belgrade, in addition to an elevation, um, a proper elevation of the, uh, the building. Uh, we are also including a uh, rooftop um, open space that's uh, a, a common space uh, uh, accessible by everybody in the building. Um, you can see that we, um, the depth of this building allows us not, uh, the access, um, elevator access and the stair access not to be seen. Um, and um, maintains a, a cleaner look. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, design implements the way the things that we, we took consideration were, were cues from Rosendale Square, um, the articulation of brick that's found commonly there. Additionally, we took massing and our, uh, additional articulation uh, moves to, um, to emulate some of the triple deckers that are um, uh, evident on the street as they march down the way. Uh, material would be brick um, and a standing seam. Uh, at the front of the building and then a, um, a density fiber, a medium density fiber um, paneling uh, on the additional uh, sides. Please. Uh, that uh, concludes the presentation, uh, 31 units. Um, we are very, uh, very uh, um, walkable um, position in the neighborhood um, and taking advantage of that to, um, 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 to provide a dense urban housing uh, that I think would be a great uh, benefit to Rosendale and a, a, uh, a commuter node um, in the city of Boston. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Could you elaborate just a little bit on uh, uh, the uh, community response to yeah. uh, your development? Sure. Um, Rosendale Square has been, um, um, obviously there is a, um, commuter rail there and a large uh, number of people in the, in the area um, have identified uh, appropriately that this is a, a great uh, node position for for um, commuters coming into um, or, or existing in this area without cars and uh, allowing uh, people to walk in and be active in a pedestrian way. Uh, so we took uh, a great effort to provide very easy access to a ground floor parking space that's basically at the entrance of the of the um, of the of the building. Um, you know, providing uh, 31 parking spaces for bikes, um, in addition to um, communication with VPEA, um, as far as um, access or a number of parking spaces that we would need um, in relation to such a, a commuter friendly. Um, location. Okay. Thank you. Zach. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any additional questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. 
Second. Paul, Paul Fargo, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion. Thank you and um, good luck. Okay, um, so it is, let's see, 526. <laughs> So we, uh, before we start our public hearings, we're gonna take a brief, um, a brief five minute recess. Um, uh, and uh, so yes, so we'll see you back here at uh, 5.31. Okay, thank you, bye-bye.
Um, so we'll now be begin the public hearing portion of our agenda. So um, for this item, simultaneous Chinese and Spanish interpretation are being provided for this meeting using language interpretation function within Zoom. We ask that you be patient in case of any technical issues. Language inter interpretation will not be enabled until instructions on how to access interpretation have been interpreted into Cantonese and Mandarin and Spanish. Once interpretation has been enabled, a globe icon will appear. A reminder to all that are speaking today, we ask that everyone speak slowly for the interpreters. <clears throat> if you are speaking too quickly, I may interrupt you and ask you to speak slower. Uh, so thank you uh, in advance. To enable interpretation for Cantonese and Mandarin and Spanish, please click on the globe icon on the bottom of your screen. And by selecting Mandarin for Mandarin, Cantonese for Cantonese, and Spanish for Spanish. Also, you must mute original audio. So, um, uh, Anna and Terry, will you now interpret the, interpret the instructions I just gave? Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anna. I'll be a continuous interpreter for the meeting today. Thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. My name is Terry. I'll be a Mandarin interpreter. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Marcella, if you will now um, uh, yes. as well. Hi, my name is Marcella. I will be your Spanish interpreter. Se ofrece interpretación simultánea al chino y al español para esta reunión utilizando la función de interpretación de idiomas de Zoom. Le pedimos que sea paciente en caso de que haya algún problema técnico. La interpretación de idiomas no se habilitará hasta que las instrucciones sobre cómo acceder a la interpretación hayan sido interpretadas en cantonés, mandarín y en español. Una vez habilitada la interpretación, aparecerá el icono de un globo terráqueo. Les recordamos a todos los que intervengan hoy que deben de hablar despacio para los intérpretes. Si hablan demasiado rápido, puede ser que se les interrumpa y pedirles que hablen más despacio. Gracias. Para activar la interpretación para el cantonés y el mandarín y el español, por favor haga clic en el icono del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccionando mandarín para mandarín, cantonés para el cantonés y español para el español. Además, debe de silenciar el audio original. Gracias. Thank you. Okay, gracias. Um, all right, Barry, um, will you now please um, activate our interpretation channel? And we're just going to wait a um, few seconds for um, everyone to join and for us just to clarify that all the channels are working. Can I have the interpreters do a test so I can make sure the channels are working? We are good. Awesome. Um, great. So if you're having any difficulty activating interpretation, um, please call the phone number on the screen and take note of the number. Um, if you have difficulties later in the meeting, you can always call that number. <clears throat> The project presentation has also been translated into Cantonese and Mandarin and Spanish and is available on the BPD website at uh, bostonplans.org slash about dash us slash BPDA dash board slash board dash meetings. <clears throat> Please take note of the website address on the screen to enable the translated project presentation. Secretary Bohemus, was there something? Yes, I, the Spanish interpretation does not appear to be working. Okay, so we'll pause. Yep, let's pause. Okay. Nisha and Barry, can, can you try and troubleshoot the Spanish channel?
I can uh, hear you now. I, I can hear you now, too. We're good to go, Madam Chair. Awesome. Thank you. This is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as a Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with Article 80D of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the St. Elizabeth's Medical Center 2022 through 2026 institutional master plan in the Brighton neighborhood, including the proposed parking garage project. This hearing was duly advertised on June 1st, 2022 in the Boston Herald. <clears throat> This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed- Madam Chair, I need you to add, to, to pause again. Okay. The Spanish channel is not working again. Okay. Yes, it's working now. Okay, so I'll just start from the beginning. From the, Can this you is, continue, Madam Chair? Should I start from the beginning, that this is a public hearing section? Go. I think we can start. It, it works when we test it, and then and then there's no interpretation once you start. So okay. let's try it again. Okay. Uh, this is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority, doing business as a Boston Planning and Development Agency, being held in conformance with Article 80D of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the St. Elizabeth's Medical Center 2022 through 2026 institutional master plan in the Brighton neighborhood, including the proposed parking garage project. This hearing was duly advertised on June 1st, 2022 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We are taking support and opposition at the same time. If you're planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active Click the I hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal to the staff that you would like to speak. When your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone. Your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. At that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of all oral testimony, any emailed testimony will be read aloud. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. Nupor Monani will now begin the presentation. Nupor. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, Director Johnson, and members of the board. I'm Nupur Monani. I'm a Senior Institutional Planner and Project Manager for the BPDA. The proposal before you today is the St. Elizabeth's Medical Center Institutional Master Plan for a four-year term from 2022 through 2026, as well as a proposed parking garage project. The IMP and the proposed project have both been under review since 2019 and are seeking approval this evening. The proposed project includes the construction of an approximately 203,000 square foot, six floor parking garage with 610 spaces at 253 Washington Street in Brighton. The construction of this garage will allow the institution to consolidate existing parking accommodations, which are currently spread throughout the neighborhood into a single location directly adjacent to critical care facilities thereby providing reliable parking accommodations and significantly reducing staff commute time. The project also contains 64 bicycle facilities, um, partly in a secure bike room with additional amenities for riders and partly as covered outdoor spaces in an effort to encourage a shift toward more sustainable modes over time. The formal Article 80 review process began in September 2019 with a PNF and an IMPNF filing. Over the two plus years um, that have passed, the team has worked with BPDA staff, with city agencies, St. Elizabeth's Task Force, and elected officials, particularly with District Councilor Liz Breeden, whom I would like to thank for her continuous and tireless coordination on behalf of her constituents in Alston Brighton. As a result of this process, St. Elizabeth's has developed a robust package of mitigation and community benefits, including both monetary and in-kind contributions. 
Key among them is the construction of a two-bay ambulance facility with lockers and additional amenity space, which will be provided for use to Boston EMS for the long term. At the neighborhood's request, the proponent has also agreed to make a provision of 50 parking spaces in an area known as the Elk Slot for use by local residents during snow emergencies. They have also provided financial contributions to two beloved and well-respected neighborhood organizations, uh, the Veronica Smith Center, the Veronica Smith Senior Center, apologies, and the Alston Brighton Health Collaborative. Um, the proposed project is also located within uh, an active planning area, one of the Alston Brighton Mobility Plan. And so several of the proposed mitigation measures help to advance key planning recommendations from this study. Um, these include advancing the design for a bus rapid transit corridor on Washington Street, the construction of streetscape improvements up to an estimated value of $100,000, the participation in the Alston Brighton TMA, uh, which is the Transit Management Association, and several other initiatives. Together, these commitments will go a long way in improving pedestrian safety on Washington Street in the short term. And in the long term, they will help the city advance planning the planning vision for this street as a key multimodal corridor in Brighton. Um, additional details about the plan and the proposed project will be shared in the upcoming presentation. I would now like to turn it over to Harry Payne from Stewart Healthcare, uh, which is the proponent, and Katie Moniz from Fort Point Associates, um, the consultant representing St. Elizabeth's tonight. They will begin the presentation shortly. We will then be happy to hear from members of the public as well as take any other questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could someone, thank you very much. Uh, good evening and thank you so much for the opportunity to present um, to the board, to the chair and to the secretary. My name is Harry Bain and I'm the regional president for Stewart Healthcare in uh, Massachusetts. St. Elizabeth's has been a staple in the Alston Brighton community for decades. As the regional transfer center for Massachusetts Stewart hospitals across the Commonwealth, Semic is equipped to treat everything from an injury requiring a few stitches to the most complex acute cases that patients and families need, from cardiac care to trauma to other complex medical and surgical needs. We have been fortunate to provide this high level of care close to home for residents of the Alston Brighton neighborhood in the community setting for over 100 years. And in fact, about 20% of our patients are from the Alston Brighton community. In an area that is considered a primary care desert, we are proud to offer five primary care offices in the Alston Brighton neighborhood to meet our community's needs. As an academic medical center, we have a commitment to teaching the future of medicine to staff physicians to make sure that the Alston Brighton patients and communities needs are met. Stewart recognizes the important role St. Elizabeth's plays in this community and has invested over $100 million in St. E's since 2009, helping to provide state-of-the-art treatment in areas such as the Canal Emergency Room, as well as our newest addition in the ICU and, and a revitalized outpatient psychiatry center. We appreciate everything the neighborhood has to offer and have hired 12% of our entire workforce from the Alston Brighton community. And we always welcome more to join us. We wanna talk about our institutional master plan and our goals with you. It's to improve access for patients, visitors and staff, create a SEMIC campus that's opening to the neighborhood where the community feels welcome, improve open spaces throughout the campus and expand critical patient care programs. Next slide, please. SEMIC provides robust contributions to the community. In addition to the clinical care we provide, we've provided over 7,700 COVID tests and more than 3,100 vaccinations for residents. We have partnered with the Boston University School of Medicine, offering academic opportunities to their students and engaging resources to expand our scope of clinical care and train the next generation of physician leaders across the Commonwealth and beyond. We also took great care to design this proposed building to fit into the character of the existing neighborhood without detracting from the surrounding atmosphere. We have designed enhanced bike access around the St. East campus and built upon the Austin Brighton Mobility Study to ensure these plans fit into the future of the neighborhood. We have partnered with the Austin Brighton TMA with active participation in the group 
and are hosting met and are hosting member bike tune-up events in partnership with them this year we're proud of the work we completed with the cambridge street mural adding a splash of color along the cambridge street corridor and in collaboration with brighton main streets we're working with brighton high to participate in their health career pathways program for students and we're offering internship programs for those interested in pursuing a health healthcare career additionally we have opened the scholarship program to Alston Brighton residents pursuing a degree in healthcare, which will provide $5,000 uh, scholarships for six students. Next slide. A highlight of this project, which we're very excited about, is a 2,300 square foot EMS facility that we will be adding adjacent to the parking garage with two ambulance bays, office space, a lounge, locker room and changing areas, and a full kitchen. Throughout this process, we have worked with EMS Boston to understand the community and the EMS service need to make sure patients get easy access to EMS, uh, to the EMS community. We're continuing to collaborate to realize this vision. We wanna take this opportunity to really thank all of the hard work by the community and task force members, city and elected officials to identify this community need and to make this community benefit a reality. This time, I'd like to turn it over to Katie. Thank you so much, Harry. Uh, next slide, please, Deport. I'm Katie Moniz. I'm with Port Point Associates and a permitting consultant here tonight on behalf of Stewart Healthcare and the St. Elizabeth's Medical Center. Uh, just very briefly, I want to take you through the four year 2022 to 2026 institutional master plan. Uh, as many people who know the Alston Brighton community know, this is a hospital up on the hill and uh, it has had some of its first buildings there since 1914. And so the vision in coordination with the Alston Brighton Mobility Study and the goals of our task force and our community members we've talked to is to knit this hospital more directly into the community that it serves and is surrounded by. And so that involves investment in the campus itself and investment in the public spaces that surround it. So you'll see on your left here that there are some facilities uh, that have outlived their useful uh, existence here on the campus. Uh, an older parking garage, uh, which really is out on Nevin Street blocking the main entrance and making it more complicated for people to find the hospital and interact with it. Um, there's also the Quinn Pavilion, uh, which is a building situated uh, between two uh, really important pieces of their campus. And really uh, at this point, it's an opportunity where we can invest in other ways where not everything needs to be a building. Lots of it can be beautiful landscape space and outdoor engagement with the patients and the visitors. And then there's the Center for Biomedical Research, the little square building in the bottom left of your screen there. It's a really important building. It holds the blood bank and the uh, critical laboratories for this facility, as well as for Stewart regionally. Uh, and through this IMP, there'll be strong investment in bringing that building, which was uh, built in the 70s, up to current times, creating accessible features, investing in the HVAC and other mechanical systems in the building. Uh, the other thing that you're really going to see through this IMP is a strong investment in the connectivity of spaces. And so where there was an old parking garage on Nevin Street, a new improved entryway into the hospital, significant investment in landscape, adding new shade trees throughout the community, and most importantly, really creating this opportunity to create on-site parking for the hospital that is sorely needed. Uh, many of the critical care staff, as well as uh, other hospital workers here are parking in off-site lots. They're parking in places as far out as portions of Watertown and throughout the Brighton and Austin communities. Um, and that makes for unnecessary shuttle trips through the neighborhood. It makes it so that it's a very unstable situation with short-term leases with third parties. And so by making this very significant investment in a sustainable new design for a garage here, we're able to connect the campus where Washington Street is lower to the upper campus, create those opportunities for people to come right onto the campus and get the care that they need and get to work in a reliable manner. Next slide, please. The pedestrian connectivity that can be part of this IMP was another thing that really Drew Stewart to making these types of investments. As many people know, there are great neighborhood side streets here that come to the hospital and they reach a point in the hill where there's no way to cross through the campus. And so the way this parking structure is proposed to be designed 
actually creates access both at the lower level at Washington at the upper level of the campus. It helps people be able to navigate this space. There's an investment in the Washington Street corner that makes it a place you'd actually like to come to. Um, and it looks to really invest in accessible uh, and beautiful spaces along Washington Street and Cambridge Street. Uh, as uh, was mentioned on the Cambridge Street mural, there was an opportunity there to work with uh, the main streets and really invest in something that was beautiful for the community and also an honor for the critical care staff from St. Elizabeth's who's working in this community. Uh, the other way that this campus is getting refreshed through the IMP is an investment in bicycle parking. Both the BPDA and BTD staffs have been great working with us to look at opportunities in existing buildings, uh, outside in the main open spaces of the campus at all the main entry points and here in the new proposed parking garage. Also an investment in having the types of facilities that encourage employees to be bike commuters um, and then creating opportunities for bike share stations at Nevins and Cambridge and Cambridge and Washington streets. Next slide, please. Uh, here is a great rendering of the proposed parking garage. And as you can see from this slide, and you'll see it again in the next one here, uh, Washington Street is down at the main level here. This proposed structure is six levels. You can enter on Washington Street, but you can also enter vehicularly from the upper campus onto the fourth floor. Uh, it features a, a brand new solar array to the St. Elizabeth's campus, which can provide over 430,000 kilowatts per year of renewable energy for the facility. The other great features that we have here is the design of the garage itself. It's a park smart sustainable design, features a very significant investment in electrical vehicle charging infrastructure, both now and for the expansion of that over time, as well as the expansion of bicycle parking now and over time. Next slide, please. Here's another angle you're looking from Shannon Street across to the garage here. And this is the vehicular entry as well as the mobility hub and pedestrian connectivity here. So we are working with BTD, with MBTA and really trying to create the best opportunity here to consolidate bicycle parking spaces, to look for opportunities to put logical crosswalks across from Shannon Street driving uh, you are perfectly aligned between Washington and Shannon in the main entry here. And then looking for pedestrian safety features. And Washington Street has had an unfortunate history of incidences with pedestrian safety. And we thought it would be incredibly important to make a contribution in the near term with BTD of $25,000 in which to do some important work for pedestrian safety starting uh, immediately. And then looking to longer uh, term investments here through our coordination with BTD and BPDA. Next slide. Uh, as part of proposing a proposed garage, we also want to invest in the other ways that people get to the campus, a robust transportation demand management program. Uh, Stuart is part of the Alston Brighton Transportation Management Association, working on the opportunities to work with other employers to connect the dots between MBTA and commuter rail stations and the hospital. Uh, significant participation here um, in bicycle amenities and neighborhood advocacy for more bike lanes and really building upon the Austin Brighton Mobility Study, subsidies for employee transit passes and having an on-site transportation coordinator. Next slide, please. We've also invested in the public realm, a brand new bocce court here along Washington Street and bocce uh, is a neighborhood favorite. We really appreciate our task force being really thoughtful and helping us design that and creating a space that feels inside and outside so that things that are happening in the garage react out to the Washington Street quarter. All of this space here out on the hospital's property being invested in to draw the community into the campus. Next slide. And with that, just getting wrapped up here, a robust community benefits program that features some things like veggie vouchers, a contribution of $50,000 uh, per year, looking to increase uh, food security throughout the neighborhood uh, the creation of jobs and revenue through the hospital operations, thinking about that mobility hub and ways that we can make Washington Street a better and safer place for people to be, and making sure that all the design elements that we bring here are rooted in good sustainability. And with that, I will uh, pass it back here to the chair and thank you for having us this evening. Okay, thank you. All right, so as this is a public uh, Hearing, we will now um, take public testimony first before um, 
questioning by the board member. So, uh, Secretary Polhemus, do we have anyone that would like to testify? Yes, we do. Gary Walker, you can unmute yourself. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, Director, Director Jemison. Uh, first off, I'd like to congratulate the director on his new appointment and welcome back to Boston. Uh, certainly look forward to working with you in the future. Um, also, uh, uh, very supportive of this project. Uh, for many years, Stewart Healthcare has been very good to the members of Oakland 103. And I'd like to thank them and uh, hope for their continued support. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. We have Chief Hooley from Boston EMS. Um, Chief, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, how's that? Is that coming through? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, just, just you know, real quickly, uh, I want to, want to add this one. First of all, thank you. I can't believe uh, we're actually here. Uh, like you said, it's been the combination. I, I know from San, from Stu and San Jose's point of view, it's been a long time coming, but this is something that, uh, you know, we've actually dreamed of for a long time. Uh, going back to myself, I've been a veteran of Boston EMS since uh, 1978, and I've had the uh, uh, work as an EMT in Brighton. I was assigned here when I was 14, back when we were uh, we were stationed up at St. E's, but we did not have a garage at the time. Yeah, we just we parked a little uh, loading dock outside by the ER. Uh, but beginning back to what uh, uh, St. E's when you first uh, began to present, uh, being part of the community, being part of it. Uh, when crews were on the, excuse me, sorry, 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 uh, when crews work out of a hospital, uh, they become uh, uh, really part of that hospital and uh, they also become part of the community that surrounds there. We know that a lot of people who work in hospitals live in the area and uh, they, uh, there is there is a real sense of that we're uh, uh, of building a team for that, and that that that's true even after all these years. I mean, I still will will we'll run into some of the nurses that that I knew back at Saney's back in the day, or other places where I satellite it. So it is very much uh, uh, it does contribute to the, to the family fabric. But beyond that, there's you know there's the obvious uh, benefits. One, it's a garage, and. Uh, you know, having a garage is the one thing, besides being a requirement by, you know, OEMS, we have a place where we can garage uh, vehicles when they're not, you know, running. Uh, you have a place that's so centrally located as Saint the St. Elizabeth's campus is for us, a place where you actually can shut the ambulance off. You don't have to leave it idling. Uh, in other parts of the city still, you know, we, we're, we still have to, uh, if you want to keep the heat up in the winter or the AC or the batteries charged, forced either ride around, uh, you know, burning uh, fuel or, uh, or idling, and then trying to find quiet locations where you can do it, where you're not gonna disturb neighbors. Uh, you know, when you have a, a garage like that, you, as soon as you have complete the call, but you can bring it in, you can ship, plug it into a show line, that's it. Uh, we, the, the uh, you know, the environment's controlled. Uh, it, it does save on fuel, it saves on uh, noise, wear and tear on the vehicles. But it also uh, it contributes to the crew's well-being because the crew can get out, stretch out. Um, uh, we can resupply our trucks from there. Yes, we don't. We still have the main supply, but uh, they can deliver a lot of things to us that we can store at a garage, such as uh, what, what you propose to build for us. So that's going to increase human availability because we're not going to have to travel as far as often uh, out of the area to try to get supplies and go meet up with somebody. And the, uh, the central location, when, you know, when we mapped this out, it was one of the reasons we put our justification in uh, for this uh, was that uh, our, it, just our ability to get to like all points in Brighton and Austin uh, is, is greatly improved. Uh, we, we couldn't find a more central location uh, than, than uh, the St. Elizabeth's uh, campus. Uh, it, and, and just uh, and, and, you know, I you know, I could I could go on and on, but but again, uh, emergency medicine has just like all medicine changes right over the years, and uh, you know there were times before when uh, Santa Mar well when you had St. Margaret's uh, there for the uh, 
we would have occasions where uh, some patients would be going uh, directly to delivery suites, maybe bypassing uh, 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 emergency or in the emergency department. Or there could be some cases of going directly to the cath lab because the EMTs and the paramedics called in did their own notification. Uh, the same way with strokes. And uh, over the years, as we're going to be developing uh, more and more, you know, advanced uh, uh, protocol screening uh, to be able to partner with, you know, hospitals like St. E's, where we'll be able to, you know, before we maybe even leave somebody's living room, uh, already have uh, the pieces in motion uh, as to where we're going to go and activating units. And by having that relationship between uh, your local EMS and the hospital, that that puts us, uh, you know, uh, years ahead of other other cities and towns. So th there's nothing but the upside to this. And I really want to thank everybody uh, who's been uh, responsible for helping us uh, every step of the way. Thank you, Chief. Minor Perez, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Secretary, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jamison. This is mine. Press, representing hundreds of union carpenters in the city of Boston and a little over 10,000 union carpenters in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, first, I want to thank the office, the, the office of Mayor Wu for allowing the community to be part of the process, and we are in strong support of this project. I also want to thank Stewart's Healthcare for also selecting a responsible employer for, to build the new facilities in Norwood and this one here. So we are extremely grateful and it is with great respect we are the board uh, for concurrence on, uh, in, what, on an affirmative uh, for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Minor. Would anyone else like to testify about this item? Please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to testify. Madam Chair, I believe that concludes the public hearing portion of this item. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Nucor, do we have any written testimony that, that needs to be read into the record, or are we good? Yes, Madam Chair, I have two very short letters which I can read through now. The first one is from State Representative Kevin Honan. The letter goes, Dear members of the BPDA, I am writing to support the CEMIC 2022 through 2026 IMP, proposing construction of a new 203 square foot parking garage with 610 parking spaces. The addition of a new garage allows for the cons consolidation of multiple off-campus leased satellite lots, the elimination of the deteriorating existing garage, and overall improved access for employees and patients. One of the most significant aspects of the project will include a two-bay EMS garage for Boston EMS. This EMS station represents a meaningful community benefit for the Alston Brighton neighborhood, primarily through improved response times and patient outcomes. It will also offer a central location allowing Boston EMS personnel to shower and change when personnel decontamination is necessary, store and restock critical supplies, and decontaminate equipment. Having an EMS station on Semex campus, EMS personnel will have on-site opportunities to attend specialty lectures, train with CEMIC emergency department staff, and participate in quality improvement activities. Additionally, the new modernized garage proposes community benefits to enhance the Alston Brighton neighborhood by mitigating construction disturbances. Included, among many other features, are bike and pedestrian mobility connections, landscaped open space, and commitments with city organizations to participate in programs related to career education. Thank you for your consideration of the CEMEX parking garage proposal, ensuring employees and patients will have access to a modernized parking facility. Please do not hesitate to call me if you have any questions. Sincerely, Kevin G. Honan, State Representative. I have one more letter, Madam Chair, from the Alston Civic Association. The letter goes, Dear board members, the proponent has appeared before the executive board on Tuesday, February 11, 2020, and Tuesday, November 9, 2021, and the membership on Wednesday, February 19, 2020, and Wednesday, November 17, 2021, with a proposal for an IMP renewal and to construct the new parking garage. The project has gone through an extensive Article 80 large project review process, consisting of three task force meetings four public meetings, three public comment periods, four Boston Civic Design Commission meetings, 
and fulfilling numerous requests for additional information. The proponent has been very responsive to community concerns over height and density, parking, transportation, public safety, screening and buffering, community mitigation and benefits, and emergency services. The Alston Civic Association voted to approve the proposal before you. Sincerely, Anthony P. Desidoro, President. And that concludes the written testimony, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, um, Chief Hooley, as well, for, um, for, your, for your service and, and all of that um, really great commentary. Uh, okay, so uh, are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Uh, with, with enthusiasm, so moved. Okay. Second. All right, the roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations and thank you to all of our uh, interpretive uh, interpreters. So we are going to move um, back to <clears throat> agenda item number 23. Uh, request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 27 residential units, including five IDP units, 14 off-street parking spaces, and 33 bicycle parking spaces located at 635 Hyde Park Avenue and to take all related actions. Uh, Caitlin and Kathleen. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, again, Caitlin Coppinger, Project Manager and Development Review. Um, the proposal I bring before you guys today is the raise, raising of an existing commercial building and a condemned multifamily building in order to construct the new four-story mixed-use building. The project proposes to include 27 residential units consisting of a mix of one and two bedroom units. This project will contribute five of its units to the inclusionary development policy at 70% AMI for a 19% total contribution. Additionally, the ground floor plan uh, plans to include approximately 900 square uh, feet of retail space on the ground floor. The BPDA held, held a well-attended public meeting um, in late March, and overall, we believe this project is a suitable development for this intersection on High Park Ave. I'm happy to turn it over to Kathleen Onfer from the planning team to discuss the context, and then uh, over to John Polgini and Travis Blake from the development team. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, this project, like the one that you saw earlier um, this afternoon, is within the boundaries of the 2007 Roslindale Neighborhood Strategic Plan. Um, the plan highlights three key themes, and the proposed project meets the spirit of the plan and these themes. 635 Hyde Park Ave is a dense residential development near a transit corridor with a mix of unit sizes and types um, supporting the commercial area of Hyde Park Ave. While the planning team is referencing the Roslindale Village Strategic Plan for planning context, they are also incorporating um, further planning goals and visions from more recent plans, such as Imagine Boston 2030 and Go Boston 2030, as well as the surrounding neighborhood context to evaluate the project. I'll turn it over to the project team now. Um, thank you, and thank you, Caitlin. Uh, this is uh, John Fulgini on behalf of the uh, our applicant. Uh, good afternoon. Director Jamison, Secretary Palamas, Chair Rojas, and all members of the board. As Caitlin stated, this is uh, a proposal that will replace a shuttered restaurant on the corner of High Park Ave uh, together with a condemned two family to the rear that's on uh, Canterbury Street. And as they stated, it'll be 27 uh, unit apartment building with 14 garage parking spaces. It went through a robust community process uh, and will provide much needed housing in a somewhat blighted site. We are happy to present this before you this afternoon. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Travis Blake from Sousa, Sousa Architects to walk everybody through the design. But again, we appreciate the opportunity to prepare before you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sean. Uh, so I'm Travis Blake, I'm an Associate Principal at Sousa Design Architects. Um, and as you can see on this slide right here, uh, this is an existing uh, aerial view. Uh, looking down Hyde Park Ave, so you can see that we have a prominent location right on the corner of Hyde Park and Canterbury Street. Uh, you notice uh, the surrounding context, there's a lot of uh, surface area parking and some one-story commercial space that make up the corners of this intersection alone. Uh, and towards the rear of our lot, it's kind of hard to read, but there's the red arrows, that's the MBTA uh, commuter rail tracks. Uh, and then there's just some three and four-story apartment 
that comprise the rest of the surrounding area. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is just a photo of the existing commercial building on the lot. Uh, you can see the adjacent residential building on the left-hand side, with the existing driveway to the surface level parking uh, on the left. Uh, on the right side, you can see that's Canterbury Street that uh, has that steep incline that goes up and over the MBTA uh, commuter rail overpass. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just another picture of the existing commercial building uh, showing how it addresses the corner of the lot. Uh, on the right side, you can see another uh, existing one-story commercial space that comprises uh, the adjacent uh, across the Canterbury Street, that corner there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a proposed site plan. Uh, in this, you can see how we uh, are you know, proposing some improved uh, site plan uh, strategies. Uh, first, we pull the building back from the property line on the north and east side. Uh, this allows us to give additional space to the streetscape where we can create a better pedestrian experience that's more in line with the Boston Complete Streets uh, guidelines there. Uh, so we provide a furnishing zone, a three-foot furnishing zone, a six-foot pedestrian zone, and a little bit of a frontage zone where we can do some plantings uh, and really soften the edge of the uh, building uh, for the pedestrian scale. Uh, we also have identified the proposed corner uh, lobby that connects the Hyde Park and Canterbury Street access for pedestrians. Um, towards the middle of the facade along Hyde Park Ave, you can see that that's where our retail entry is. Uh, farther to the left, you see that we are infilling portions of the existing curb to create a 12-foot vehicular access. Uh, to the left of that, we are creating a buffer between that and the adjacent lot at 643 Hyde Park Ave. Uh, on the right-hand side of this image, too, we are also proposing to infill uh, an existing curb cut that was along Canterbury Street as well. Uh, next, please. Uh, it looks a little tough to read, but um, this is sort of the programming of the first floor. Uh, it does show the corner entrance um, down the bottom you know, right-hand side of our, our lot there. Um, this ties together that pedestrian access, like I said. Uh, the lobby would then be directed to an interior bike storage for about 34 bikes and a bike repair space, which we use to sort of activate that facade along Canterbury Street by incorporating windows, so it's, it's very uh, visible. Uh, the lobby would also lead to the, the elevator for the upper residential units, comprising 27 total units. It's 18 one beds, and nine two bed units. Um, and then this lobby would also connect to the fully enclosed garage uh, for a total of 14 parking spaces. Uh, and this is just a better view of that whole uh, driveway access for the 12 foot drive aisle uh, to a single garage door um, where we kind of pushed everything up towards the middle of the building so we could increase the open space towards the back of the lot. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is the north elevation, uh, which is a view along Canterbury Street. Uh, you can see how we're using a series of bays to create a stepped facade to break down the scale of the massing. Uh, the change of materiality from a 10 inch sip lap siding uh, on the first level uh, to a more traditional 6 inch hard plank uh, further increases, uh, reinforces the idea of the human scale for the pedestrians. Uh, at the left of the elevation, you see how we tried to maximize the storefront uh, as you go towards Hyde Park Ave. That would be like the uh, bike storage and repair shop there. Uh, and then we also used uh, the idea of this uh, large bay to wrap the corner, uh, really just to tie the facades together and address the, uh, the, the prominent intersection of all the commercial spaces on that side. Uh, next, please. And then this is just our, our rendering view of that intersection looking back at our building. You can see that uh, main bay that wraps the corner there. You can see kind of the undulation of the facade uh, as you go down Canterbury Street and Hyde Park as well. Uh, you can also see how we are incorporating the street trees uh, on both access roads there. Uh, and then the, the frontage zone as well, where we're kind of softening the edge of the building. Uh, next, please. Uh, and this is just another view. This is farther down Hyde Park Ave. Uh, this kind of shows the side elevation over the driveway. Uh, and this is where we're incorporating some Julia balconies and some recesses within the bays uh, to create some private outdoor spaces for each of the units there. Um, and then on the first floor, you can see how, you know, we really increase the storefront along that edge to really activate that along Hyde Park Ave. Uh, next. And it's just an overview. So, uh, 
Um, we're around if you need any questions. Uh, we'll be here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, the motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Lanspar? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Congratulations. All right, item number 24. Request authorization to issue a scoping determination relieving further review pursuant to Article 80, Large Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 61 residential rental units, including 10 IDP units, 49 garage parking spaces, and bicycle storage located at 40 soldiers, soldier, soldiers field place to recommend, a, to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for the necessary zoning relief and to take all related actions. We've got Caitlin and Kathleen again. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Caitlin Coppinger. Uh, thank you for your continued time tonight. Uh, the proposal that I'm going to bring before you today is the raising of an existing commercial building in order uh, to construct a six story residential building consisting of 61 units, 49 parking spaces, and six, uh, 61 bicycle park parking spaces and ground floor amenity space for their residents. The BPDA held a public meeting in February and two IEG meetings, uh, both in February and March. These meetings were well attended and had active participation from the IEG to create a robust mitigation package, which includes 10 IDP units at a range of AMIs and monetary contributions to the Alston Brighton Mobility Study, uh, the Alston Brighton TMA, um, and the Leo Birmingham Parkway Trust. This project is a great input addition to the two other recent projects um, on either side of this building that have been recently approved with one under construction. I'm happy to turn it over to Kathleen Onifer from the planning team to discuss the planning context and then Joe Hanley and Jonathan Gar Garland from the development team to begin their presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. This proposed project is located in the North Alston Strategic Framework for Planning, which was adopted in 2005. This framework was later updated with transportation and urban design guidelines, but those updates did not include recommendations specific to the area that includes 40 soldiers to have place. The North Alston Strategic Framework for Planning identifies the area where 40 soldiers to have place is located as a mixed use area to allow uses such as research and development, institutional and residential, among others. Planning staff found that the proposed project is consistent with the framework and provides new housing responsive to the need for transitions in scale, vehicular circulation, and design between this location and its surrounding context. Planning staff also found the proposed project to be consistent with more recent planning, such as the Alston Brighton Mobility Study, Imagine Boston 2030, and Go Boston 2030. I'll now turn it over to the development team. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, and thank you, Caitlin, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Paul Hemus, uh, Attorney Joe Hanley, McDermott, Colty, and Miller. Um, Director Jemison, uh, congratulations on your appointment and welcome. Uh, I am here with uh, my client, Jeff Fuhrman, who is the proponent. Uh, also with me is Jonathan Garland, who is the project architect. Um, before I hand it over to Jonathan, I would just like to say thanks to uh, the BPDA staff, to Caitlin, to Kathleen, uh, Michael Christopher, um, and uh, to the members of the IAG and to uh, District City Council Braden, who was very helpful in um, guiding us through uh, this process. It was a very positive process on the community level, uh, and it has resulted uh, in an opportunity to introduce uh, a form of housing that has a good percentage of family-sized units and also in, in exceeds uh, the IDP requirement both in terms of percentage of on-site affordability but also for a wider range of uh, income levels and as a result of this um, we the project was favorably received and we're also um, excited to be delivering a sustainable development with all electric heat and hot water sourcing uh, at a very attractive design in a location that um, this board may be familiar is emerging from commercial sprawl at the northern edge of Brighton uh, to what is becoming more of a residential opportunity for the neighborhood within close proximity to 
uh, the now not so new, but somewhat new uh, Boston Landing. And with that, I'd like to ask Jonathan Garland to take you through the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jameson. Uh, I'm Jonathan Garland with J. Garland Enterprises. We're the design architects for the project. Next slide, please. So here you can see this is a, a context, neighborhood context map. The red rectangle in the center of the screen is where the site is located. It's bounded by Soldiers Field Road to the north and Soldiers Field Place to the south. And then just north of Soldiers Field Road, you have the Charles River. Um, just south of Soldiers Field Place, you have the Mass Turnpike uh, running along the page. Next slide. Um, as well as far as con additional context, we have to the left hand side of us um, two other permitted projects, one that's in construction and one that has been permitted through the city. On the left hand side is 44 to 46 Soldiers Field Place as seen in the top left image. And then the far right image is 1550 Soldiers Field Road, where if you go out to the site today, it's uh, pretty far along in construction. And so our site in the middle is 40 Soldiers Field Place, and we uh, really tried to uh, work the massing into those uh, two, two new buildings coming online. Next slide. As far as the program, and uh, consistent with what Joe mentioned, this is a uh, family-style building. There was a strong preference for family-style living in this neighborhood, so we're pleased to uh, come, come today with this particular program of 25 one-bedroom units in 36 two-bedroom units, resulting in 60% uh, two-bedroom units on the site. Uh, these are not micro units, these are not small units, these are amply sized, uh, well-designed, and uh, will be well-constructed for the long-term family-sized units. Uh, the ground floor, in terms of the parking program, has 14 parking spaces, and then there's one level of below grade at 35 for a total of 49 parking spaces resulting in a ratio of 0.8 per unit. Next slide. This is a collection of existing conditions photographs uh, on the site. The top left image shows the site today with a large swath of uh, pervious, impervious paving uh, asphalt there with a small one-story commercial red brick building that would be raised in preparation for the new construction. The other image Images show the proximity of the building in relation to Soldiers Field Road. And then you also have some of the images on the, the bottom with the building in relation to Soldiers Field Place. Next slide. Uh, this is an image showing the ground level. Uh, what you can see is the main entry at the far right of the image on Soldiers Field Place with the red arrow. If you come in there, there's the elevator lobby. Just north on the page is a children's and families amenities uh, space. That was something that came out of our really robust uh, discussions with the neighborhood and the community is to provide amenities that would really be catered to children and families. We also have bike storage that's covered that's uh, within the ground floor of the building in that purple area. And then to the far left, we have uh, private entries for the two individual two bedroom units that front along Soldiers Field Road. And obviously in the middle of the building is where we have uh, the parking garage. Next slide. Uh, looking at level two, uh, this is a wood frame building from this point up. So you're looking at a series of one and two bedroom units. The one beds are in the yellow color. The two beds are in the blue color. Um, a lot of these units have privatized outdoor balcony space, which we know is a critical thing for urban living ways in finding private um, outdoor space. We also have a common amenity space, lower left on the plan, which integrates with a common terrace for some elevated outdoor space and views over the trees to the Charles River. Next slide. This is an exterior urban, urban design image that shows the building at the main entry along Soldiers Field uh, Place. We did not place the main entry on Soldiers Field Road, just given the immense amount of uh, car traffic, the speed at which the cars move. So we wanted to uh, bring the residential entry along the side street, which is Soldiers Field Place, much more pedestrian friendly and uh, oriented for the main entry. So we've distinguished it with a particular character of wood look fiber cement siding to give it a sense of warmth and a, and a critical identity point 
as to where the entry into the building is. Up above, we have a two-tone material palette with a, a whiter or a lighter uh, metal panel and then a darker metal panel to the right-hand side with balconies that are expressed on the elevation. Next slide. This is a view from Soldiers Field Road that overlooks the Charles River. Again, we took that two-tone palette and brought it across this part of the building to break up the massing, provide this level of visual variation and depth. Uh, the, the ground floor podium is articulated with an iron spot brick material, and then just above that you can see the glass railing where the outdoor amenity space uh, coincides with the indoor amenity space. Next slide. Um, and the point I'll mention on this slide is that the, the space between the buildings was of critical concern, not just to us, but the BPDA planners and the community to make sure that we're providing a sense of openness and transparency. As you can see, this is a great example where the building to the left of us has this undulating facade and we kept our facade orthogonal to really maximize the level of openness between the buildings and this pathway really feeling public both uh, day and evening. Next slide. This is more of a zoom in of that pathway and we're working really hard to integrate with our neighbors uh, in terms of how this plan will, will come together with hardscape and, uh, and landscape vegetation on both sides. Next slide. Uh, this concludes our presentation and this is just showing an image again of, of day and night where we're really thinking about uh, that experience of safety and that experience of welcome as you uh, engage in this new project in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you, great presentation. Um, all right, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Seconded. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Item number 25, request authorization to issue a determination waiving further review of section 80A-6 of the zoning code in connection with the notice of project change for the hotel project as described in the first amendment to development plan for the hotel project within plan development area number 87, Guest Street and Life Street which reduces the overall project square footage from 140,000 square feet to 130,000 square feet, including a decrease in growth floor area of retail use, restaurant and service uses from 8,500 square feet to uh, 6,150 square feet with a uh, 1,900 parking space cap in the Brighton Landing Garage or within Boston Landing. And to take all related actions, we have Sarah and Kathleen. Thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paulimus and Director Jensen. As you may recall, the Boston Landing Project along Guest Street and Brighton was originally approved by this board back in 2012. NB Development Group submitted a notice of project change on August 7, 2020, which contained updated use and dimensional information on all of the Boston Landing projects, including the proposed project. The BPDA reviewed that NPC at a public hearing on October 15, 2020, and the director issued a determination waiving further review on January 22nd, 2021. On October 27th, 2021, NB Development Group filed a notice of project change with the BPDA. The NPC provides an update on the design of the proposed project and confirms that the proposed project will comply with the use, dimensional, and parking requirements set forth for the hotel project in the large project review filing, PDA master plan, and development plan. The proposed project includes approximately 130,000 square feet of hotel uses and approximately 6,150 square feet of retail use, restaurant use, and service use. Parking for the hotel will be provided in the Brighton Landing Garage. The BPDA hosted an IAG in public meeting on November 29, 2021. The comment period subsequently closed on December 13th, and the project was approved at BCDC on May 3rd, 2022. At this point, I would like to hand it off to Kathleen Onfer from the Planning Department, followed by Keith Craig and Harry Wheeler from the Development Team. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Board. Uh, this hotel project is located within the bounds of the Brighton Guest Street Planning Study, um, completed and adopted by the Board in 2012. 
The key issues of that planning study were to establish a mixed-use transit-oriented district as a western gateway to Boston, to make sure that any future development created urban blocks with a hierarchy of streetscapes, um, and to achieve the long-term funding of commuter rail service, um, which has you know, thus happened through subsequent advocacy study by the state and funding commitment by the property owner, um, and is now an important part of the planning context for this area. The hotel project um, itself, I think we've got one more slide potentially, yes, um, is consistent with the plan recommendations for the area, um, including being located in an area envisioned for greater height and density near the turnpike. Um, achieving an urban block pattern, including extension of Arthur Street, uh, as achieved as part of previous development, and continuing the establishing guest street as a main street that connects the district, um, includes active uses and safe accommodations for all modes of transportation. Um, this area is also included within an area for mixed use development with an FAR between three and four and a height of 150 feet. And the hotel project is compliant with the planning study. I'll now turn this over to the project proponent. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Madam Chair, members of the of the board, Director Jamison and Secretary Paul Hemis, uh, Keith Craig with the MB Development Group. Uh, we are the master developers of Boston Landing. Uh, the Boston Landing Hotel is an exciting component um, that really completes the vision for Boston Landing. Uh, we believe it's an important uh, piece to the ongoing success of, of, of this area as well as a, a very needed amenity uh, to our to the neighborhood. Um, as Sarah mentioned, this is an approved project in the PDA master plan um, and is compliant with all the parameters of the PDA development plan as well. If I could turn it to Harry, um, Harry Wheeler from Group One Architects and he can present our current design. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, Madam Chair, members of the board. What we are showing here is, as mentioned previously, is the hotel located in the purple centered in the overall site plan. Uh, this is the last building to be uh, constructed or approved in the Boston Landing Master Plan. Uh, adjacent to us to our east is the Alston Yards development uh, shown in the yellow, which shows the future uh, connectivity to Guest Street and extension of Guest Street and how our project will integrate with that proposed development as well. Uh, next slide, please. We'll quickly go through some existing photos, which you can see here. Uh, the site is located at the corner of Guest and Arthur Street. Uh, the existing sidewalks are remaining, as well as the existing parking and infrastructure. Uh, we will be infilling the site, uh, which is adjacent to corner infill site, which will connect to the New Balance retail store to our west and to the New Balance headquarters building to our north. Uh, the site is indicated here in the green grass area with the diagonal uh, pedestrian path running through it. Next slide, please. Which will be a few photos of the existing site. So if we can just go to the next one as well. Uh, and we will be connecting to our existing bike paths and pedestrian walkways. We have worked with the uh, adjacent of Butter as well as the city to make sure our connections of bike paths and pedestrian paths will connect across our the street to Guest Street um, to the adjacent development uh, with ease and connectivity. Uh, we're also uh, adjacent to the Boston Landing commuter rail, which will be just to the north of us at the end of Arthur Street. Uh, our pro project shown here will connect to the existing open space, not only on the proposed uh, retail building rooftop, uh, but the existing berm uh, open space area, which is within Boston Landing, which is again existing. Uh, next slide, please. Our floor plan and site plan here, you can see blue is the hotel use. Uh, we'll have a very transparent and open engaging lobby. Uh, we'll have a two-story space, which this will connect to the open space and meeting level on level two. Uh, we also, in the red, are showing our restaurant, which will wrap around Guest Street and Arthur Street and have a corner, prominent corner entrance. You'll also notice that we're setting our building back on the ground floor from the property line uh, to extend that pedestrian realm and offer uh, exterior and patio seating uh, for, and create some indoor-outdoor space for the restaurant. The angle and cant of our building also aligns with the uh, proposed development at Austin Yards and further bridges that connection uh, between uh, Boston Landing and um, Austin Yards. Next slide, please. Our existing elevations of Guest Street and Arthur Street 
again, 10 story building housing 171 hotel rooms. Uh, we have that ground floor open transparent uh, space, which is a 120 foot one story build uh, podium, which aligns with the retail experience of uh, the New Balance building next door. Uh, you'll see in this uh, page and the uh, following pages, this artistic element at the second level, which we work very closely with the neighborhood groups and BCDC and the BPDA uh, to have this open space experience where we notched out our building uh, to engage with the existing open space within Boston Landing um, and actually create some artistic scrim that will uh, wrap around our second level, which will house all of our internal public space of meeting rooms and public areas, uh, which will just create this artistic element that we're bringing in from some of the graffiti and art accents uh, within the Austin Brighton um, neighborhood. Next slides, please. You can, you can see here the burn that rises up to the second level, which uh, extends that 20 feet up on this right hand image. Uh, and then again, you can see how we engage with our with our scrim uh, and you will see our open space in the following slide. You can probably just keep going through these. And uh, here's the, the view from the future park, which will be in the Austin Yards development, um, our ground floor uh, retail corner for the restaurant, and then our 10 story building, which extends up, which the facade uh, has this pattern of, of solid and glass, and which also edged with some color metal panels. Again, this building as the last piece to be built within the Boston Land Development is all about movement and artistic and color and bringing all those elements that have been set forth in Boston Landing through to fruition uh, in this last project. Uh, the corner rises up as it uh, extends up as a movement towards the Austin Yards development. Uh, and we step down towards, with respect, towards the New Balance building and we step down towards our open space as we go to the west within the Boston Landing development. Uh, next slides. You can just kind of click through these. Here's our main entrance uh, to the hotel, the restaurant seating outside on the public sidewalk. You can see that open space and scrim above. Next slide, please. We're engaging within the retail building and bringing some of that material facade into the ground level of our building. So again, unifying the, uh, what's existing and having that wrap the corner to again, tie these streets of guest author and the existing buildings all into this uh, one larger statement. Next slide, please, which should be the open space our notch where the existing berm rises up. It'll be integral to our uh, patio, which is indoor outdoor space, uh, semi-enclosed, and also activates the rooftop of the existing New Balance building, which is currently uh, just a rubber membrane roof. Next slide. Uh, this is the final aerial view, which concludes our presentation. Here you can see how we tie the existing architecture to our north and to our west. Um, and again, we have our nice presence of the ground floor restaurant and corner elements. Um, which would be a nice connection to the Austin Yards development and a great completion to the Boston Landing master plan, which uh, has been very successful. So happy to answer any questions uh, that the board and the committee may have. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Madam Chair, I have a quick question for Harry. Harry, is there a flag yet on that hotel? Uh, there is not a flag as of yet. Uh, we're working through this. Once we have the approvals, we. Uh, can go from forward and do that marketing, but the proposal is that this will be a uh, upper upscale hotel. Again, we have some meeting space. We we don't have a pool or amenities or things like that. This will be catering to the uh, higher end uh, office and market that the track is bringing into the community. So it'll be really catering to the people that are within that Boston landing as well as an extension of the hotel needs within Boston, but more of an upper upscale um, hotel development. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions? Okay, hearing and seeing none. Uh, motion is in order. So moved. Seconder. Okay, we'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair vote. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, thank you very much. And thank good you, luck. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Right. 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 Item number 26. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 39 residential rental units, 7 IDP units, 17 parking spaces, and bicycle storage, located at 1789 Commonwealth Avenue, and to take all related actions. We have Quinn and Kathleen. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Polemus, and Director Jemison. Proposal before you is an Article 80 small project at 1789 Commonwealth Avenue in Brighton. 
The project, proposed project consists of the restoration of an existing two-story building and a five-story rear addition. The resulting residential building would be 38,865 square feet with 39 re rental units, 17 at-grade garage parking spaces, and 42 bike parking spaces. The project will provide 18% of the proposed units as affordable rentals between 70 and 100% AMI. This project will employ several transportation demand management measures in order to take advantage of the building's proximity to transit options and mitigate its impact on the surrounding community. The BPDA held two public meetings for this project in April and June of 2022. Those meetings were well attended and advertised in local newspaper and online. I want to thank members of the public, elected officials and the representatives, and the city agency staff who attended these meetings to help review this project. Now I'll turn it over to Kathleen Onifer from the BPDA Planning Division to discuss the planning context that was considered in the review of this project before Jeff Drago and Dan Artigas from the development team begin their presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. The proposed project is located within the recently adopted Alston Brighton Mobility Study Area, which focuses on increasing mobility for all Alston Brighton residents for all modes of transportation. Planning staff also referenced citywide plans such as Imagine Boston 2030 and Go Boston 2030 in its review. And planning staff also considered the surrounding context, such as the proposed project's proximity to commercial and mixed use developments nearby and to several MBTA stations, namely Chiswick Road Station. The proposed project contributes to the overall walkability and transit oriented development described in the Alston Brighton Mobility Study. The project is also within a 3F4000 subdistrict of the Alston Brighton Neighborhood Zoning District and adjacent to MFR or multifamily residential and uh, LC commercial designated subdistricts. While the project will need zoning relief from the Zoning Board of Appeals, it contributes to the goals of increased housing within walking distance of transit and bike infrastructure. I'll now hand it over to the project proponent. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, and Secretary Polimus. Um, my name is Jeff Drago with Drago in Toscano with a business address of 11 Beacon Street. Uh, with me, I also have Dan Artigas from Embark, the architects on the project, as well as the developer, City Realty, uh, Josh Fetterman, on behalf of that team. Um, we're excited to be here for the proposed project uh, that we're showing here before you. Um, the project, as was mentioned, is to renovate the existing two-story structure. Um, this does fall within the Aberdeen Historic District, and we worked closely with the community and the commission to restore, to have a restoration of that front building. Um, we will also have uh, a five-story uh, rear addition in the back, um, and this total will house 39 units with 17 parking spaces. As was mentioned, this is a great commuter location. We are directly across from Chiswick Road MBTA station, station, which houses the green line for those folks in the building um, that would be commuting. Um, as I had mentioned, we have the historic renovation in front. We also are excited that this project will have an 18% affordability for inclusionary development. That's seven um, units within the building with varying AMIs from 70 to 100%. Um, the district, as was mentioned, is a 3F, although we're surrounded by multi-family residential district as well. If we could go to the next slide, please. As you can see, the highlighted blue area on top are the two lots that combined as one of the larger lots in the area at 21,521 square feet. Um, along the Chiswick Roadside, you can see uh, multifamily apartment complexes, both in the rear as well as directly next to us. As we go down the lower screen, this would be across uh, for site context, uh, across Commonwealth Ave, just so you can see the varying uh, buildings around the area as well. Uh, at this time, uh, if we could turn to the next slide, I'm also gonna turn it over to the architect, Dan Artigas, uh, to go over the project and his plans. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Dan Artigas. I'm with Embark. We're the architect for the project. Uh, the plan in front of you is the landscape plan for the project. In addition to uh, retaining the uh, original home, we'll also be rebuilding the existing uh, rubble stone wall, uh, which is indicated at the bottom of the page, right adjacent to the, um, the parking access driveway. We uh, looked very closely at both the landscape design as well as the significant grade change from Commonwealth Ave to the uh, the middle portion of the site. Uh, we 
are dealing with almost 30 feet of grade change. So there are a number of ways in which we are navigating the site and connecting uh, the rear addition to the front building. Uh, we're maintaining the existing side yard setback at the top of the page uh, to retain much of the existing tree canopy on the site, as well as coming up with a comprehensive planting strategy for uh, the site adjacent to the driveway uh, as and uh, providing a dedicated and protected pedestrian access uh, way to the new building, uh, which is both accessible and protected from vehicular traffic. Currently, there's uh, almost uh, 20 steps from Commonwealth Ave to the existing house entry. If you go to the next slide. Uh, this is just the parking plan showing that slope walkway from Commonwealth Ave back to the parking area at the rear, 17 parking spaces, as well as two lobby areas, one for the main building in the front and a designate and its requisite elevator, as well as one to the rear for the addition. Next slide, please. In addition to the 17 uh, vehicular parking spaces, we have 42 bike parking spaces, uh, so over one to one uh, for the unit count, as well as meeting all of the city of Boston's guidelines for uh, bike parking in the site, providing larger size spaces as well as uh, high density spaces. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the first floor plan showing where that bike room is located, as well as the significant ledge and grade change in the center of the site. Uh, there is a connector piece uh, at the second floor, which connects the addition to the front building. Uh, and just also in the front building, providing a lobby and amenity space uh, in the existing home, uh, maintaining a lot of the uh, craftsman character and, uh, and restoring the house to its former glory. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a section showing uh, that grade change as well as the connector piece. What we tried to do with the design is uh, working very closely with the historic consultant uh, research and bring back craftsman style character to the front building and then minimize the scale and the impact of the connector piece connecting the front and the rear addition. And then in the rear addition, looking at uh, larger style casement windows with uh, traditional style muntining and um, a mixture of horizontal, uh, a mixture of exposures in horizontal lap siding in uh, colors that will pull the building away uh, and uh, have it kind of situated within the, the natural context uh, and landscape at the rear of the site. I believe that is the end of the presentation. Happy to answer. Oh, so just in summary, 39 residential units, 85 construction jobs, and 52 bike parking spaces, 42 of which will be inside the building, and 10 will be located on uh, the street at Commonwealth Ave. I believe that's the end of the presentation now. Thank you, thank everyone. Sir. Questions folks may have. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll we'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Lansmeyer. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, thank you, congratulations. Very, very cool design, I like it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, uh, item number 27. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 47 home ownership units, including seven IDP units, 15 below grade parking spaces and bicycle storage located at one through four, Terrace Place and to take all related actions. We have Quinn and Karen. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Secretary Polemus and Director Jemison. The proposal before you is an Article 80 small project located at one to four Terrace Place in Mission Hill. The proposed project consists of the construction of a six story, 47,792 square foot residential building. This transit oriented development will contain 47 home ownership residential units, including seven affordable IDP units and provide 15 below grade resident parking spaces. The building is located less than a quarter mile from the MBTA Roxbury Crossing Station. This project will contribute significantly to a Boston Transportation Department fund for the implementation of findings of their ongoing Terrace Street Improvement Study through a $71,688 contribution. 
Paris Street has seen significant development in recent years as the area shifts from a industrial to residential character. And the impl implementation of these recommendations uh, will ensure that the area is safe and enjoyable for current and future residents. The BPDA held two public meetings for this project in August of 2021 and May of 2022. These were both well attended and advertised in the local newspaper and online. I want to thank members of the public, elected officials and the representatives, and the city agency staff who attended these meetings and helped review this project. I will now turn it over to Karen Chavez from the BPDA Planning Division to discuss the planning context that was considered in the review of this project before Mike Ross and David Lee from the development team begin their presentation. Thank you, Quinn. Good evening, Chair Rojas, Secretary Polimas, members of the board, and Director Jemison. My name is Karen Chavez, and I am the neighborhood planner for Mission Hill. The proposed project is not located within the boundaries of a recent planning initiative. Instead, planning division, division staff is considering the neighborhood context, adopted citywide plans, including Imagine Boston 2030 and Go Boston 2030, Article 59 of the Zoning Code, and public feedback to review the project. The key considerations of the BPDA staff during the review of the project were that it adds to the number of home ownership units and that it is in a good location for transit oriented development due to its proximity to public transit. The MBTA has an existing access easement on this property which supports critical maintenance and operational aspects of the MBTA's rail operations and therefore this project requires MBTA license agreement review. Written notice of, written notice of this approval must be submitted to the BPDA. The BPDA uh, design review staff will continue to work with the proponent to finalize the site plan with accurate accounting of open space square footage and the mitigation for loss of tree canopy. I will now turn the presentation over to the proponent team to present the project in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Karen and Quinn. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Mr. Director. Director Jamison, uh, congratulations on your appointment uh, and the value it brings to our city. Uh, on behalf of the development team, uh, led by our principal, Matt O'Hara, my name is Mike Ross, attorney with the law office of Prince Lobel. I'm here today with our architect, David Lee, uh, in introducing this project. I wanted to thank the BPDA, Councilor Bach, and the Mission Hill community uh, for their working with us throughout this process. The end result uh, will be a 47-unit uh, building of home ownership, along with seven on-site IDP units exceeding uh, the required levels uh, that will contribute to the growth of Mission Hill of the Mission Hill neighborhood. Uh, in particular, we worked with the Mission Hill Neighborhood Housing Services uh, to enter into an agreement uh, that will ensure that a majority of the building is owner occupied uh, and that it restricts uh, transient and short term leasing. Uh, we wanted to point out to the board uh, that in addition to the transit oriented nature of this building, there will be additional monetary contributions made toward long-term transportation planning along this busy corridor. Additionally, working with BPDA staff, the project team exceeded requirements and adopted several of Boston's green building and carbon neutral goals to meet the city's proposed zero net carbon standards. At this point, I would like to turn it over to the architect, David Lee, to present the plans. David? Thank you. Uh, I too would like Join others in congratulating and welcoming me back to town, my friend and colleague Arthur Jamison. It's good to have you back. Uh, this, uh, as has been mentioned before, has been kind of a backwater on the edge of uh, Mission Hill for a number of years, but it's really evolving at a, as a lively uh, mixed use street with uh, a lot of housing coming back, all within walking distance of the T, but also very close to the Southwest Corridor bike path as well. So there are multiple options for how to get around the site. Next site, next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, the area has been somewhat neglected. Uh, there are just some empty parcels here and there. And uh, on the back side of the site or the east side is uh, a right of way uh, next to the Southwest Corridor, which uh, needs to be maintained for the uh, MBTA. Uh, but we've been able to use part of it uh, for our uh, uh, open space uh, for our site as well. Next. Uh, this is the, the lower level of the, of the building showing that we have uh, 15 uh, parking spaces. We have sufficient uh, uh, bike storage. We can accommodate up to about 48 bikes. And in the upper left-hand corner, we're carving out some space 
uh, for residents to come down where we barbecue and have a little privacy down next to the uh, MBTA and uh, uh, transit corridor. Uh, next. The uh, building uh, on, from the Terrace Street side uh, steps to uh, allow as much uh, open space at the ground level to match the city's uh, uh, complete streets initiative. Uh, the principal entrance and the uh, generous lobby next to it are right on axis with uh, Allegheny Street, which looks right down to this site and uh, will provide uh, places for people to, to uh, engage the building, but also to get more eyes on the street uh, uh, day and night. Uh, we're also having balconies there. And uh, on the roof, uh, we're actually going to have a, a large community room with exterior space uh, for the tenants, which will have uh, wonderful long views down toward uh, downtown. Next. Uh, this is the uh, Southwest Quarter side of it, uh, and we're sort of emulating some of the kind of muscular architecture that was uh, once in that area when it was a, a, a corridor of uh, breweries and, and other buildings like that. And there still remain a couple of really robust buildings, and so we wanted in our mass and materiality to kind of match the strength of the uh, facades and buildings along the way. Next. This uh, gives a sense of what it might look like from the uh, Terrace Street side. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, just uh, to the right there uh, the uh, entrance to the building on axis with Allegheny Street and then the uh, large lobby that's going to look out. And then we have uh, uh, balconies on the upper levels. And you can see on the very top level there, you can see the canopy element, almost a trellis element like which is uh, connected to the uh, community room and will make that upper space uh, a shared uh, amenity for the entire uh, building. Next. And then this last shot gives you a sense of uh, the context in terms of the Southwest Quarter on the right there and how this building uh, would be viewed uh, from the distance and also how it holds its own with this uh, fairly large building just to the north of it, uh, which has already been constructed. And, and you can imagine on that upper level the, the terrific views that are going to be available for us to be looking uh, south and east and toward downtown. And with that, uh, I'm prepared to, to end our presentation. Great, thank you. Um, okay, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Um, I just have one, um, just, just out of curiosity, kind of, you know, if, um, how, how the coordination with that, with the MBTA is, um, uh, is going. So like that, that back portion of it, that I was just confused on like the easement or how, how that works and like who's responsible for what. Well, that's Madam a bit, bit above my pay grade, but <laughs> I'm going to let uh, Mike okay. and Quinn, Quinn address that because it is a little bit complex because actually the MBTA has a right of way on property owned by a, the owner. So I'll leave that to uh, Mike to sort out. Uh, I'm Chair uh, Mike Ross here, uh, attorney. We looked at it uh, for the client. So that that's the, a rear easement uh, that is owned by um, by uh, by us, by the by the proponent. Um, however, there are rights on that easement that we must respect that the MBTA enjoys that has to do with access. They're very general rights. Um, and uh, as you saw on the plan that, that uh, Mr. Lee presented, uh, we actually didn't build uh, on the, at all on any, anywhere on the easement. Um, even though maybe perhaps one could argue you could, we took the, I think, the conservative approach and didn't uh, build on that. Uh, we are in the middle of the review process with the MBTA and we've filed uh, the appropriate licensing agreements and provided them with all the information that they uh, requested. Uh, the only thing that uh, might be uh, in the way of the uh, easement itself would be the overhanging balconies, but even those are over 20 feet above off the ground and certainly wouldn't be uh, not allowed by any easement, and not this easement. Um, that's really, uh, that's everything I can tell you about the easement and the relationship with the MBTA. Okay, good. Yeah, I was just, just curious. Um, okay. 
Any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. Uh, so moved, and you've got a, 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 um, a very uh, creative solution to a challenging site there, so. So moved. Second. Oh, second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair group. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, good luck. Thank you all. All right. Item number 28, request authorization to issue a scoping determination waiving further review pursuant to Article 80, Large Project Review of the Zoning Code for 114 affordable rental and home ownership units, including three live work home ownership units, 3,000 square feet of exhibition retail cafe space on parcel eight, located at 400 and 402 Pontiac Cass Boulevard and 10 garage spaces located at 2070 Washington Street and to take all related actions. We have Nick and Kathleen. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison and Madam Secretary. We are here before you this evening to discuss the proposed project at Parcel 8, uh, also known as 400 and 402 Melnia Cass, and also known as the Nuba Residences. The Parcel 8 request for a proposal was released on February 26, 2020, and the BPDA received three proposals in response to the RFP, including from Gateway Nubian Partners, LLC, Groma, LLC, and Nuba, LLC. All three proposals received were determined to be responsive and responsible according to an April 15, 2021 BPDA board memorandum. On April 15, 2021, the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan Oversight Committee, after consulting with the in-place community's project review committee and additional public outreach, including a public review period, received the PRC's recommendation of Nuba LLC as the developer of Parsley. On April 15, 2021, the BPDA board authorized the director to award tentative designation status to Nuba LLC as developer of Parcel 8 located at Harrison Avenue and Washington Street in the Nubian Square area of Roxbury. The Nuba team has proposed to create a new mixed-use residential building containing 104 units of affordable housing, five artist live-work units, five commercial spaces for artist uses, an exhibition space and cafe, and a new park on the corner of Washington and Melnia Cass. Of the 104 units, 60 will be rental units, and 44 will be ownership units. Four of the artist's live-work units will be rental, and one will be ownership. The project will also bring a great deal of economic investment to the area, including $100,000 to support the ground floor exhibition space, a $50,000 fund to help local nonprofits, establishing a $100,000 entrepreneur fund to support local businesses and $150,000 to support on-site community services through Operation Pathways. This project will bring much needed vitality to an underutilized parcel of city property, help to preserve artist space in the neighborhood, and help to create a gateway to the Nubian Square neighborhood. Additionally, the project will be designed to be all electric with electrically sourced heat and hot water, a solar PV array on the roof, and will reach a lead multifamily mid-rise gold score of 71. Throughout the process, the project has enjoyed strong community support and enthusiasm for the changes that it will bring to what was formerly an empty lot. I will now turn to Kathleen Onifer to walk you through the planning considerations for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Planning for the disposition of Parcel 8, the site of this project, was completed in 2019 as part of Plan Nubian Square, a 2.5-year-long collaboration with the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan Oversight Committee and the then Department of Neighborhood Development, now Mayor's Office of Housing. This process established priorities and a vision to catalyze economic development through the activation of publicly held real estate, including creating housing options for a wider variety of households in the area. The plan establishes a one-third low income, one-third moderate income, and one-third market rate target. Parcel 8 is located in the gateway cluster of Plan Nubian Square, an area of new development at Melnia Cass and Washington Street. The project advances the plan's housing goals, including supporting culture by including artist workspace and artist units. 
One planning consideration that has arisen since the adoption of Plan Nubian is the adoption of the Coastal Flood Resiliency Overlay District, which was adopted into zoning in October 2021. Modeling completed as part of the Coastal Flood Resiliency Overlay District and the Coastal Resilience Design Guidelines indicates that Harrison Avenue is a flood pathway that will reach the site. The project thus must comply with the requirements of the Coastal Flood Resiliency Overlay District or sea fraud, as we like to call it, um, and the coastal resilience design guidelines, including elevating living spaces above the sea level rise design flood elevation and protecting critical systems and access to the, the building. This will continue to be a focus of the project through resilience review and design review going forward. I'll now turn it over to the project proponent. Thank you, Madam Chair and member of board. Uh, this is Cameron Zahiri. I'm principal of Urbanica Design and Development. I'm here tonight with our partner, Becky Adnani, from the NHP Foundation, and our architect, Stephen Chong. The view that uh, you see on the screen right now is uh, from the mainly, from the mainly hotel and residences across the street, which we developed around uh, four years ago. Uh, this is the corner of uh, Washington Street and Melnia Cass. Um, the proposal is creating a park at the corner of Melny and Washington, which will be the welcoming to the Nubian Square area. Next. As I explained, you know, the buildings actually is a two separate buildings. One is a home ownership, which is facing the park, and one is a rental building, which is at corner of Harrison Avenue and Melny Cast, and is next to the new campus of Benjamin Franklin Institute and um, along, you know, Melnia Cass. Um, you can go to the next one. As you can see again, the project is, a, you know, two buildings on the right side is a affordable home ownership. And the project is a hundred percent income restricted uh, units anywhere from 30% AMI up to 120% AMI. On the first level of the buildings is all gonna be the workspaces facing the Melnia cast for artists. And there is a huge 3,000 square feet exhibition space facing the park for the promoting art and culture in New Ben Square. Uh, the building goes from five stories uh, to six stories on the Harrison Avenue when it meets the park the building actually steps down. And as you can see, the building also on the first level is a scallop shapes that embodies all the trees, existing trees that is very critical, you know, for this part of the uh, neighborhood. Next, please. This is a uh, view from Washington Street next to the non-factory. Uh, we are uh, making your uh, building 8,800 square feet of public park, uh, which is going to be facing the exhibition and artists and learning spaces. And the buildings, as you can see, is about five stories uh, facing the park. This park can be activated uh, from the local artists for the sculptures, uh, music, and different activities. We hope uh, non-factory is going to be transformed to the dance uh, studios and this uh, park will be pretty much it gets activated you know with all these new uh, energies that are going to come to this uh, community next please again this is the facing from the washington street toward melnia cast the two uh, squares you see here is resemblance of two old uh, foundation uh, that used of the houses used to be here. The houses was, one was Josiah Cunningham house was built in 1784. And the other one was Jesse Doggett house, which was built in 1788. And we are basically uh, outlining the foundation line of uh, those houses. And eventually we could probably have some other informative uh, plaques on the park or in the museum described uh, the history of this uh, area. Next, please. As I mentioned, the 
both projects is 100% uh, income restricted uh, units anywhere on the home ownership from 60% AMI to 120% AMI, total of, total of 47 units, and goes between, you know, live and work and uh, one bedroom and uh, two bedroom and three bedrooms. On the rental side, you can see we have anywhere from 30% up to 120%. And again, they have live workspaces. We have one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedrooms. Uh, so it's total, you know, of the 114, you know, units of work, live, and residential spaces, which is going to pretty much activate this corner. Our office of Urbanica is actually across the street from this side. And, uh, we would love to see more activities in this part of the neighborhood. Next, please. Again, here you see coming down from Washington Street uh, the, and parallel to Melnia Cast. All the, uh, on, the, on the right side, you see the exhibition space and the cafe that is going to serve the neighborhood and the exhibition space and also the residents and the artists on the first floor of the building. On this path that we go down, mostly it's going to be workspaces of the artists that facing uh, the Melnia cast, and they have a buffer of uh, green and vegetation between the sidewalk and their space so for some privacy. Next, please. Uh, this is pretty much the entrance to uh, home ownership coming off from Melnia cast. So the whole idea again try to reinforce uh, life on Melnia Cast. Right now, Melnia Cast is pretty much a vehicular uh, access, but uh, by doing you know, more projects and having more entrances open to these areas, you hope we have more uh, pedestrian activity on Melnia Cast. Um, next, please. You see again from uh, above, you know, the above we are proposing to have our mechanical system on the roof, plus the Voltec panels. And the building you know, makes you know, different uh, moves. In, and uh, this pr design uh, got uh, the approval at the first hearing with the BCDC, which they said it's, it's the second time that they approve one project at the first shot. They like the simplicity of the project, the buildings, and they thought it really fits in the neighborhood. And it was pretty much a flattering to get the approval on the first you know, review. Um, next, please. Again, you are seeing from the other side, uh, Madison Park planning to build 12 stories building across the street. So this is the view from the parcel 10, looking at this uh, uh, parcel eight building. This is a home ownership. We are planning to have some uh, lights, you know, vertical lights to illuminate the facade and just creating you know, more interesting at the night time. And next, please. Uh, this is the view from the Benjamin Franklin side on the back side of the buildings. Uh, the side between Benjamin Franklin and us is another development site that uh, is owned by Benjamin Franklin. And we hope they will consider you know, that our design and this whole neighborhood to make it, you know, much better uh, in, uh, corner of Harrison Avenue and uh, this site. Next, please. Again, this is the view from the um, Melnia Hotel at nighttime, uh, looking at the park and looking at the, you know, building. The front part is a condo building and the back part is a rental building. And uh, so that's pretty much the, uh, our presentation for tonight. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, all right, do we have any questions or comments from the board? For those of us who've worked in uh, this neighborhood for uh, decades, this is a, a very satisfying project to see. Thank you. Great. I really like all the, um, you know, the preserving and, and intentionally setting aside the green space there, um, you know, knowing that there's that the empty parcel, uh, you know, next next door. Um, just it's beautiful. Thank you. 
I agree, and I would just like to add it really encouraging to see the number of affordable home ownership opportunities there too. So nice job. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so with that, I believe our motion is in order. So moved. Seconded. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Um, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, item number 29, request authorization to submit applications to the Commonwealth Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development, MassWorks Infrastructure Program, in support of the following project. Um, <laughs> BFIT uh, Nubian, oh, so BFIT Nubian Infrastructure, Nubian Ascends Phase 2, 135 Dudley Infrastructure, Nuba Residence Parcel 8, and to enter into grant agreements with the respective proponents for funds from the MassWorks Infrastructure Program grant and to take all related actions. Dana. Thank you again, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Mohimus, and Director Jemison. The MassWorks Infrastructure Program is a part of the Commonwealth's Community One Stop for Growth, which has sought to combine several funding sources that are managed through the state to support real estate development. The program funding source provides opportunities for municipalities which oversee permitting and development projects and the management of initiatives particularly focused on real estate development, housing creation, business development, and infrastructure improvement. Every fiscal year, the Executive Office of Housing and Development provides municipalities with an application as part of its funding round and asks that said applications and related projects in keeping with key principles of the program, including the creation of income-restricted housing, enhancing public realm, economic development, and job creation. These grant funds are managed through the BPPA on behalf of the city in collaboration with the Community Economic Development, Capital, Construction, and Engineering Department, as well as our administration and finance teams. The grant awards have typically been in the ranges of uh, $750,000, as large as $4 million, and are usually made, awards usually made in the fall of the calendar year with contracts issued in the of the succeeding winter. As part of the process for reviewing potential applications for submission, BPDA staff work with collab in collaboration with city agencies, such as the Mayor's Office of Housing, the Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, as well as the Office of Intergovernmental Relations, to ensure that the projects that are viewed meet city, city priorities, such as those outlined in the Imagine Boston 2030 planning initiative. In addition to considering the community one-stop program principles, BPD and city staff take into consideration other key factors such as readiness to proceed, in other words, uh, having completed regulatory and permitting issues, feasibility from a financial standpoint, and also project. Because of the intentional review and vetting by staff, the BPDA, the Boston by extension, has had a fairly high success rate with receiving grant funds. Projects that are similar and have received funds in past fiscal years include developments such as Compass in the Village in East Boston, the Jackson Square Phases 1 and 2 in Jamaica Plain, Harvard Commons in Mattapan, Parcel 9 in Melbourne Postal Investments in Oxbury. In addition, certain business development projects such as Flextronics in the, in the Industrial Park and the 12 Channel Center for Mass Robotics in the Industrial Park were also recipients. In the past five fiscal years, the BPA that's we applied for and received grants totaling approximately $24 million. And as I mentioned that milestone, I'd also like to acknowledge the fantastic support on the efforts of our capital construction department led by William Everson and our administration and finance teams, including Linda Kwan and Michelle Goldberg. As mentioned earlier, the projects that are deemed appropriate for this community one stop and MassWorks funding include the, Mass, the Benjamin Franklin in their, in their move to Nubian Square, the Nubian Ascends Phase 2, the 135 uh, Dudley project is at the former Area Beach Police Station site in Nubian Square, and the proposed Nuba Residence Project on Parcel 8. With the board's approval, we will be able to not only submit applications, but also enter into the appropriate contracts once the state has made its recommendations for approval. With that, those will be close of my remarks, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. 
Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Item number 30, request authorization to issue a scoping determination waiving further review concerned to Article 80, Large Project Review of the Zoning Code for 69 income restricted residential units, including renovating the existing 15 on site uh, single room occupancy units, 24 garage parking spaces, 5,534 square feet of first floor commercial space, and bicycle storage located at 554 through 562 Columbia Road to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for the necessary zoning relief and to take all related actions. We have Stephen and Kathleen. Good evening and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Board, Madam Secretary and Director Jameson. My name is Stephen Harvey and I'm a Project Manager at the BPDA and I want to thank you for your time today. The project I bring before you today is 554562 Columbia Road, located in Dorchester's Uplands Corner. On February 10, 2021, the Boston Planning and Development Agency received a letter of intent from the proponent. On June 23, 2021, we received the project notification form for the proposal. The proponent proposed to restore the existing four-story Fox Hall building, as well as add a five-story addition to the rear of the existing Fox Hall building where the parcel is currently vacant. If approved, the new mixed-use building would maintain the ground floor retail, but add 65 rental units and 24 parking spaces. Most exciting and importantly, this proposal is an all affordable development with no displacement. This means the proponent has agreed to work with the current tenants to avoid any displacement. Again, this is an all affordable development that will add 65 affordable units to the city's affordable unit housing stock. I held two virtual public meetings and two virtual IAG meetings for the project. The meetings were well attended and the majority of communities, community members were supportive of the project. Uh, both virtual public meetings were advertised in the local paper and by email. The common period for the project ended on June 3rd, 2021, 2022, sorry. And I'll hand it over to Kathleen. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. The proposed project is located within the Uphams Corner Arts and Innovation District. This district is the product of several planning processes, including the Upham Corner implementation process and the Uphams Corner station area plan of the Fairmont Indigo Planning Initiative. A primary goal of these planning processes is the promotion of economic development without displacement. The proposed project achieves this goal by retaining existing income restricted units as well as the existing ground floor retail businesses on site. 100% of the new units will be income restricted and marketed to local artists. Key to this project is the preservation and reuse of the existing four story building on site known as Fox Hall. It is a key component of the architectural and cultural significance um, in Upham's Corner. And the design of the new building takes cues from this existing fabric in that building, including um, sophisticated strategies to step down to the lower scale homes on Virginia Street. Public realm improvements include the preservation of an existing mural on Arian Street and improvements to the intersection of Arian Street and Columbia Road. The proponent team has been very responsive to BPA staff feedback and the result is a project that will enhance the character of the neighborhood. At this point, I'd like to hand the presentation over to the proponent team to present more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Before uh, Jewel starts, I would just like to add that we've also gotten written support from District 3 Boston City Councilor Frank Baker, State Senator Nick Collins, State Representative Liz Miranda, as well as community members of letters and local businesses. Uh, apologies, and I'll hand it right over to Joe. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Kathleen. Good evening again. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Attorney Joe Hamley, McDermott, Colty Miller, uh, good evening to, to Secretary Paul Hamas and uh, Director Jemison. Um, we are very proud to be here tonight um, uh, with the result of a community-based development in the heart of Upcombs Corner, um, as Stephen indicated, uh, and Kathleen as well. Uh, the existing building, Fox Hall, is an asset and a jewel to the Upcombs Corner uh, community. Uh, it'll be uh, restored, uh, retained, and as you see uh, on the 
uh, overview here, there is a vast surface area, surface lot that's underutilized in the back that we are looking to introduce uh, new housing uh, in an appropriate manner that complements the planning efforts of the city uh, and the needs of the community. Um, I would just say with respect to the residential housing, uh, what, are we, what we are most proud of is the fact that it'll include uh, not just all income or restricted affordability, but a vast range um, for lower income earners all the way up to the middle class um, that we consider to be uh, very important. And as Stephen indicated, uh, the existing tenants and the commercial businesses in Fox Hall will remain uh, and they will have an enhanced uh, environment within the improved structure, so no displacement. Um, before I hand this off to our team, I want to just introduce you to them and say a few words of thanks. Uh, as Stephen indicated, uh, we appreciate the engagement and support um, by the elected delegation, the community, and especially the members of the IAG uh, and uh, Stephen, Kathleen, Mike Christopher, Alexa Pinard, and Ted Schwartzberg, who uh, lent a lot of their time and guidance uh, to make this such a uh, great development for the neighborhood. Development team is a, a joint venture between uh, Michael Rooney of JLCD Development uh, and Cruz Development. Um, with me tonight is Michael Rooney, John Cruz from Cruz Development, and our architect, uh, Jim Podeski from the architectural team. At this point, I'd like to hand it off to Michael Rooney. Mike. Thank you, Joe, <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. Um, great to be here tonight. Very proud to introduce this project and very proud to be working with uh, Cruz Development, the, the largest um, uh, MBE in the, uh, uh, in certainly in the state of Massachusetts, and I actually think the largest MBE in the, in the Northeast with a lot of great work in this area and around the, uh, around the Roxbury area as well. Um, <clears throat> this uh, slide shows uh, the, um, uh, the project site locus. Uh, if uh, the, the building directly across the street, the multi-tiered building across the street is actually the Strand Theater, which is noted. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this um, <clears throat> uh, this uh, air view shows the, uh, the existing building and the, uh, the real lot before we did um, some major cleanup to the real lot. It's a uh, significant element to the historic character of Uplands Corner and it was very important uh, to us and to the community to preserve that, uh, to preserve that building. Next slide, please. Uh, additional views of the, um, of the building from, uh, from the street, uh, directly across the street and uh, an angled view which actually shows a, uh, a mural that we actually commissioned to have done by Artists U Artist for Humanity. Um, and that mural will actually remain uh, on the site and be preserved as part of the development. Next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, these uh, three slides show the work that we've done since we've taken ownership of the property uh, two years ago. It was a blighted area um, with uh, trash and weeds and, and uh, other uh, materials left by uh, vagrants. And, uh, but we took the time to clean it up, make it more aesthetic for the neighbors across the street and more usable for our own tenants. We have 15 single room occupancy tenants uh, in the existing Fox Hall building. And, um, and, and during the um, pandemic, we, uh, we decided to pave an area in the back to facilitate the business of our ground level restaurant tenant and, um, uh, and help, with, uh, help with their um, uh, progress through the, through the pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to our, our architect, um, Jim Podesky from TAT to introduce the design. Thanks, Mike. This is the uh, site plan and landscape plan. So for orientation, 
Columbia Road is on the east and Arian Street is to the south. Uh, the existing Fox Hall building is on the right and we are retaining the existing three retail spaces on the ground floor. Uh, access to the parking garage for the 24 parking spaces is on Arian Street, as is the main entry to the building and is shown with the red arrows. Uh, landscaping is added at the rear yard toward the west left, left side of the page as well as to the north side. And we are working with the Columbia Crossing team to develop the plan for the spaces between the buildings to the north uh, that works uh, for both projects. Next slide, please. This is a rendering looking northwest. Fox Hall can be seen in the foreground with the new six-story addition behind it. Uh, as was mentioned, the materials on the addition are primarily brick to complement the Fox Hall building, and solar PV can be seen on the roof. Next slide, please. This is a rendering looking northeast. The addition is now in the foreground, uh, and we've worked with the city and the neighborhood to step down the building in the rear uh, down to the residential neighborhood uh, to the west. And due to the grade change, the height at the rear is only four stories, which is in line with the large houses uh, on Virginia Street. Next slide, please. This is a view from Virginia Street. And in this view, you can see the previous schemes and the evolution of the project with the dashed lines, the red and the blue and the yellow dashed lines. In subsequent schemes, we reduce the height and step the building as to reduce the massing toward Virginia Street. Uh, the final scheme is shown here. Next slide. This is a view from Columbia Road. Uh, Fox Hall is in the foreground again. Uh, we are rehabilitating the facade and replacing all the windows uh, on this, this historic building. Um, the addition can be seen on the left side of the view um, along Arian Street going up to the left side. Next slide. These are the elevations of the building. So starting in the lower right corner, you can see Fox Hall uh, elevation on Columbia Road. Um, the lower left elevation is uh, the elevation on Arian Street showing the six stories. Um, upper right elevation is the elevation toward Virginia Street, the four stories, with the stepping back on the top. And the upper left elevation is the north elevation uh, toward the new Columbia Crossing, a proposed Columbia Crossing project. Next slide. And this is a site section, a cross section of the project, uh, showing the proposed, our proposed six story building to the left in context with the proposed uh, project to the north, the Columbia Crossing building to the north. Next slide. And I think that's the... Uh... Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, Madam Chair, this is just sort of a restates, obviously, a lot of the highlights um, of this project. Again, 65 uh, units and be all affordable without displacement. And again, that mix of AMIs, um, construction jobs being created, and also the opportunity to um, enhance mobility and tap into uh, this transit node uh, with the Uplands Corner Community Rail Station literally steps away. Uh, and also to bring a clean uh, and sustainable uh, development uh, for the residents of the building. So that concludes our presentation and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Um, 
Thank you and congratulations. And thank you for preserving the historical nature of that building and, and just finding a, a very um, uh, great way to, to build and add housing uh, to that area, so. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, item number 31, request authorization to issue a scoping determination waiving further review pursuant to Article 80, large project review of the zoning code for the construction of 81 residential rental units, including 12 income restricted units, 60 garage parking spaces, 81 bicycle spaces, and a blue bike station located at 270 West 2nd Street to recommend the approval to the Board of Appeal for the necessary zoning relief and to take all related actions, we have Stephen and Mark. Uh, good evening, and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Jameson. My name is Stephen Harvey, and I'm a project manager at the BBA, and I want to thank you for your time again today. Um, the project I bring before you today is 270 West 2nd Street, located in South Boston. On June 29, 2021, the Boston Planning and Development Agency received a letter of intent from the proponent. On September 29, uh, 2021, we received the project notification form for the proposal. The proponent proposed to demolish the single-story industrial building and construct a modern five-story residential building on the site. If approved, the new building will contain 81 rental units, 60 parking spaces, and 81 bicycle parking spaces. The proposal would also add 12 affordable units to the city's affordable unit housing stock. I held two virtual public meetings and three virtual IAQ meetings for the project. All meetings were well attended and the discussions were fruitful. Both virtual public meetings were advertised in the local paper and via email. The comment period for this project ended on March 23rd, 2022. Um, the project has the written support of District 2 Boston City Councilor and current Council President Ed Flynn. The development team and I are thankful for his support. I would now like to pass it over to my colleague and community affairs liaison, Mark McGonigal, to touch on the planning context for the area. Once Mark runs through the planning context slide, Frank Smith, the project architect, will present the presentation. Joe Hanley, the project attorney, and Phil Lavoni, the proponent, is in attendance as well. Once Frank completes the presentation, we will answer any questions put forward by the board. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you, Stephen, and good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, and Secretary Paul Hemus, the Mark McGonagall Community Affairs with the BPDA. Uh, the planning context, uh, thank you, next slide. Uh, planning context with 270 West 2nd. Uh, once noted, it's not an active planning area at the moment. Uh, of course, we start with citywide plans on down and make sure it's consistent with those big picture goals. Uh, next on neighborhood plans, upcoming anyway, the South Boston Transportation Action Plan is right around the corner, we're able to uh, secure uh, around $200,000 towards uh, both some of that planning effort as well as some pedestrian improvements, particularly sidewalk improvements. Uh, this is within a half mile of the Broadway T station. Uh, and also on neighborhood context, uh, if you remember last board of the board before we approved in close proximity 202 West First, an R&D uh, proposal. And so uh, adding some residential in close proximity to that recent approval also, AFFH, uh, AFFH, I'll leave it at that, uh, affected this uh, and is consistent with those proposals that actually brought down uh, some of the AMIs for the IDP uh, portion. Uh, and lastly, on zoning code, um, this I mistakenly put, oh, I'm sorry, this is part of uh, Article 68, uh, most recently amended in 2011. And while this building does uh, surpass some of those limits, it's not by much. And as the project proponent will get into in more detail, uh, we feel that uh, it's, it fits appropriately given the surrounding uh, already developed buildings. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to the development team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And um, thank you, Stephen, again, uh, for the last time tonight, um, Attorney Joe Hanley, and thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Secretary Paul Hemus and Director Jemison. Um, I also want to thank, uh, in particular, Mark McGonigal and Mike Christopher and Stephen Harvey for their invaluable time and guidance and uh, to the South Boston elected de delegation, the members, the IAG, and a lot of uh, longtime residents in this section of South Boston's uh, lower end. Uh, as Mark indicated, um, this uh, part of the neighborhood in Article 68 was 
uh, was changed from industrial to residential in 2019 and then updated in 2011. Why that's important is this particular site um, is an old vestige of that industrial when people uh, worked and lived in South Boston, but also uh, perhaps more recently had to endure uh, the not so pleasant mix of industrial uses next to their homes. Uh, we are on the south side of First Street corridor uh, between uh, Second and First Street, it's a through lot. And um, the existing use uh, is a squid processing plant. Um, and so we think by introducing residential with the on-site amenities and with the commitment to supporting and upgrading um, public realm accessibility, mobility around the neighborhood, uh, that we can create something uh, that fits better uh, for the future of the residents. And so with me tonight uh, is my client, uh, Phil Balboni and Bill Cress. Phil is, uh, his family is the longtime owner of this property uh, for nearly half a century. And uh, he is uh, very knowledgeable and committed to the South Boston community and interest and excited to deliver this product, uh, project, excuse me, with his partner. Uh, we're also working with Prowitz Chelinski uh, Architects and I have Frank Smith, who is with me this evening, to take you through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, good evening. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide here. So here to start us off with a little context, uh, you know, our lot is uh, located near the intersection of D Street and West First Street. Um, and as Joe mentioned, this is a through lot with frontage along both West First Street, West Second Street. You know, an interesting thing about this site is you, if you notice along West Second Street, you have a sort of smaller scale residential neighborhood, uh, whereas West First Street, um, you see some more of those industrial uses. Uh, next slide. Here we have some context images. And so to the right on West Second Street, uh, you can see that the squid processing facility uh, is actually, you know, it's a rather small building. Uh, the lot is, is really largely defined by its loading. Uh, one thing to notice along West Second Street is we actually have you know, over 90 feet of curb cut uh, for 125 feet uh, to serve those uh, loading purposes. And uh, similarly on West First Street, uh, you see these images here really show um, sort of the loading uh, in use uh, next slide. <clears throat> so one of the things that we really focus here looking at the, the ground level uh, is looking at the streetscape uh, and what we can do to in, improve the uh, public realm here. And so along West First Street, what is now uh, roughly four feet of sidewalk, uh, we've expanded up to 14 feet. Um, and this is, you know, to allow us for, uh, for street trees, uh, for bikes a share station, as well as a good pedestrian experience. Uh, similarly, uh, along West 2nd Street, um, we've expanded the sidewalk to 10 feet uh, and you know, healed those curb cuts and, and provided space for those same amenities. Um, one of the important collaborations uh, with the BBDA was really working to make sure that there was no back of house, uh, that both West 1st Street and West 2nd Street uh, were active. And so you'll notice that our main lobby and our bike room is along West 1st Street. Uh, however, we also have an additional lobby and bike room along uh, West 2nd Street, both with a lot of glazing, um, with the goal here to make sure that, you know, these sidewalks are well lit and active. Uh, and on the second floor, uh, we can see our courtyard level uh, where we are providing amenity uh, for our residents uh, but I think more importantly, the goal here was to really pull the building back, create these uh, courtyards to ensure that we have light and air for our residents. Um, and not only our residents, but for our neighbors, our existing neighbors as well, and even thinking about uh, potential future neighbors. Uh, next slide. Here we have some sections. Uh, the top section here is illustrating uh, how we've stepped the building down to four stories along West 2nd Street. Uh, you'll remember that's the more residential neighborhood and we wanted to be respectful of the scale along that street. 
uh, and we look at the lower section, this is really just illustrating the degree to which we've really pulled the building's uh, footprint back on the upper levels to ensure light and air uh, for all residents. Uh, next slide. And here we have uh, a render of, of the building. We see 345 D Street. It was, it's our neighbor here in the foreground for context. Uh, our building, in terms of the material palette, uh, is a warm brick. Uh, we uh, also have bays to help break up the facade. Uh, and you'll notice along the, the streetscape here where we put some focus, uh, we have additional, uh, we put in street trees where there are none along the street uh, currently. Um, you know, and you can also see that uh, the majority of the facade on the ground level uh, is glazed and, and well lit. Uh, next, level, uh, next slide, please. And here we have uh, West 2nd Street. Uh, and, you know, this you can see that expression, uh, of, you know, the four story expression by dropping down a, a story along uh, West 2nd. Uh, the goal here really has always been to be uh, respectful uh, of the scale and of the context um, of this neighborhood along this street. Um, and similarly, you know, with West uh, First Street, you can see the addition of uh, some new street trees. And again, uh, keeping that well-lit, glazed uh, ground level for the pedestrian experience. And uh, I think that's uh, what I have for the next slide. That's thank it for me. Frank. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Frank. And Madam Chair, just to kind of bring this into a close here, here are the highlights um, and things that we think are, you know, really important benefits of this project in the respect to the live category. Obviously, we talked about the 81 units, but uh, Mark McGonigal had mentioned too, we worked hard and through the AFFH program to exceed not just the required allotment of affordability on site, but also to uh, include um, more um, family sized units for affordability for a greater range of income earners, both uh, lower and towards the middle class. Um, we also, you know, think that we have a responsibility for live not just within our corners of our project, but within the neighborhood itself. And that's what we learned uh, from the folks who lent their time to us in the community. And that's why we're creating an on-site dog walk, not just for us, but to alleviate some of the impacts that the area parks are feeling from dogs coming from other buildings that don't have those facilities. And our particular block happens to be uh, right, we're in the same block as Buckley Park, which uh, is between um, D and E here in the lower end and needs a lot of upgrade and renovation and has formed a friends of committee, which we're excited to be adopting and engaging with uh, to help along with Flaherty Park, which is nearby as well. The opportunity to create 180 construction jobs and we talk about connectivity. Um, one of the important things about this is, you know, we are in uh, sort of a transition section of the neighborhood. But uh, if you know this part of the lower end, uh, the sidewalks, there's a lot of buckled sidewalks. There's a lot of old industrial that doesn't have accessible widened sidewalks. And so uh, we're helping to set uh, the way for that. And uh, while we're only a half a mile to the Broadway station, uh, T station, which is very busy, we're making investments to help people get there back and forth better, and also to invest in the MBTA transit service analysis so that we can enhance ridership, um, not just for our residents, but for the neighborhood as a whole. And finally, uh, as Frank detailed, we're excited to provide um, a all electric and sustainable development that would be uh, LEED Gold certified. So thank you for hearing us out and for the opportunity to present this to you tonight. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, thank you. And I think almost on cue, both my dogs visited during that presentation. So, um, you know, do uh, do love that that you uh, are incorporating that space as a former, you know, uh, downtown city uh, uh, dog owner. Um, it, it's definitely an amenity that that is um, that is lacking in a lot of those areas. So, um, questions or comments from the board. Okay, hearing and seeing none. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Julian Smart? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. 
And the chair goes aye. Motion passes. Uh, thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much. Have a nice night. You too. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, re uh, request authoriz item number 32, request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 35 residential rental units, including six IDP units, 35 garage parking spaces, and 35 bicycle parking spaces located at 354 East, or East Street. Um, to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for the necessary zoning relief and to take all related actions. Stephen and Mark. Good evening and thank you, Madam Chair, once again, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden. Um, my name is Stephen Harvey and I'm a project manager of the BPA and I want to thank you for your time today again. Uh, the project I bring before you today is 354 East Street, located in South Boston. On November 19, 2021, the Boston Planning and Development Agency received a small project review application from the proponent. The proponent proposed to revitalize the former St. Vincent's DePaul Roman Catholic Church building, transforming the former church into residential housing. The new residential structure will contain 35 rental units, 35 parking spaces, and 35 bicycle parking spaces. If approved, the proposal would not only preserve and modernize this historic building, but would add six affordable units to the city's affordable unit housing stock. I held a virtual public meeting for the project on December 14, 2021. The meeting was well attended and the project was very well received. Uh, the virtual public meeting was advertised in the local paper and via email. The common period for this project ended on December 20th, 2021. I would like to pass it over to Community uh, Affairs Liaison Mark McGonagall to touch on the planning context for the area. Once Mark runs through the planning context slide, Shane, the project architect, will present the presentation. George Morancy, the project attorney, is also in attendance. Once the presentation is complete, we will answer any questions put forward by the board. Thank you once again for your time today. Thank you, Stephen, and good evening once again, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, for the planning context for this proposal, um, once again, this is not an active planning area. Uh, of course, we start the larger citywide plans and zooming in on neighborhood context, unlike the previous proposal, uh, this is more of a mid-neighborhood uh, fabric, uh, not along the edge, uh, but in close proximity to that previous pro uh, project. Uh, it directly abuts and overlooks uh, neighboring Buckley Playground. Uh, and of course, we're saving uh, the existing church, which believe it or not, there was some conversation uh, about the merits of doing that at the initial onset of this project. Uh, and the zoning code, this one is in the um, South Boston Rezoning Initiative area of 2016. Of course, is an adaptive reuse of the current church. Uh, those dimensional regulations are rather moot in this instance. In public feedback, uh, initial concepts entertain more of a, what I call a respectful modernization uh, of the church, but uh, the community really felt strongly they wanted to keep uh, the historic nature of the church as much as possible. And so the team will get into more detail, but essentially we're saving the church, which adding some uh, room in the top for additional living space. Uh, so with that, I will pass along to the development team. Someone may still be on mute from the development team. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison. Secretary Flemis, I'm Shane Losey with Chew and Company Architects representing the project team. Um, this initial slide is a aerial from the southeast. You can see the existing St. Vincent's Church in the middle here. Um, Buckley Playground is behind the church. To, on the street on the left side is West 3rd Street. The street on the right side of the church is Bolton Street and E Street runs side to side in front of the church from this perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have some context photos. The top left is Third Street looking towards E Street. You can see Buckley Playground in the left corner, uh, lower section behind that grayish car. Um, on the bottom left, we have the view of Bolton Street towards E Street again. Uh, again, we see Buckley Playground 
in the corner here in the right side of the photo with the trees. Um, you can see the narrow sidewalks that exist now on Bolton Street and the existing parking area up against the side of the church further down the road in the photo. Um, the lower right, we have the view from Bolton Street looking at, for, I'm sorry, from E Street looking down Bolton Street. Um, again, you can see the parking lot up against the side of the church, uh, the narrow sidewalks that run down Bolton now. Um, and the existing church here. On the upper right, we have the view from E Street looking down West Third. Um, behind the construction fence is a um, set down hardscape kind of patio area right now. It acts as window wells for the existing lower level of the church, which is a community room. Um, and you can kind of see some of the existing details of the church with the round windows on the upper levels, um, the arched windows down below, and just some of the details of the existing building. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here we have a proposed landscaping plan. Um, I'll start on the top left, which is the back of the building, the butting up against Buckley Park. Um, we have our access to the building here with a narrow curb cut. So this is access to the ground floor garage. Um, along Bolton Street, we are increasing, I think a, a big part of this, especially where the building takes up the majority of the lot now, was um, trying to improve the public realm as much as possible. So along Bolton Street, we've increased the existing sidewalk from four feet to seven and a half feet. Um, and then the existing parking area that is there now, we've replaced with uh, green space for the majority of Bolton Street. Uh, we've also filled in the curb cut that runs basically the entirety of the lot along Bolton um, to make that sidewalk even, you know, improve that sidewalk even more for public realm aspects. Um, along E Street, where there's not much space to add anything, but we are adding a little bit of green space on the corners. Um, the sidewalks right now are in the existing condition. We're widening them out a little bit on each side of the entries. Um, the street trees that are there now are existing. As we come around the corner from E Street to the bottom portion of the slide is West Third Street. Um, there are a couple of existing street trees here. We're adding a couple more. Um, and then also increasing the green space on this side. So right now, as I mentioned in that photo earlier, it's a depressed kind of patio area from the sidewalk. So we're, raised, we're filling that area in, raising it up, um, creating this green space, adding visitor bike parking, and as well adding an access to an at grade bike room on this side of the building. Um, and then as we kind of move to the back, lower left portion, we're back at Buckley Park. The next slide, please. Um, this is the ground floor plan. As you can see, we have, uh, it's kind of hard to read on this, but the dashed lines are the existing footprint of the building in the back. But we're coming in on the top left off of Bolton Street for the garage access um, for the 35 garage parking spaces. On the E Street side, we're providing a community room slash amenity space for the building that will be open to um, public meetings for the community. Uh, we have the central lobby that re uses one of the existing entrances, entrances into the church. And then we have the, the bike room prominently placed on the corner of West Third and E with direct access out to that area I showed on the site plan next to the accessory bike parking. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the Bolton Street elevation. So the proposal, you can see there's, there's a, the lower left is the existing facade. So it's, there's a lot of roof on the church now. Um, in order to try to create some living space within that roof, we're adding dormers along the roof line in um, 
correlation with the windows below. Also on the middle section of windows, we're increasing them up to, or we're increasing the size of them and, and expanding them up to the existing round windows that are on the upper level of the church. Um, so as we move down to the right, on the lower right is the entrance off of Bolton Street. So Buckley Park is on our right in this photo or image. Um, the back section is, we're doing about a 12 foot addition off the existing extension. So, whoop, sorry. Um, we're doing a 12 foot addition off the existing extension using red brick, which is similar to what's there already. Um, the existing materials on this side are a pudding stone and we're obviously maintaining that on the existing church. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the West Third Street side, very similar to the Bolton Street uh, with the addition on the left. Buckley Park is on the left. Um, again, the red brick. The difference is on this side is the existing stone is granite. It's actually um, stone that was taken over from Fort Hill when downtown when it was redeveloped um, in the 1800s and moved to this location and rebuilt on portion of the church. So it's on this facade and the front facade of the building. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the rear of the church. So we want to take advantage of obviously having the park next door. So we're trying to open up the building as much as possible to that park view. You see on the top right, that's the existing facade, which is basically a blank brick wall up against the park now. We're looking to create some kind of interaction between the building and the park by opening up those walls. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the front elevation. So it's pretty similar. We're just adding window, larger window openings to accommodate some of the living space that we're adding. Um, you know, we're going from one story to six stories. So obviously needed to add a bit more window space where there wasn't much here now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's a rendering looking down West Third Street from the back, Buckley Park's on the left, the addition with the brick you can see coming out, um, and then the dormers on the roof. Next slide, please. And then again on Bolton Street, similar. Um, you see the garage entrance on the lower right and the dormers on the roof, the extended windows in the middle of the facade of the existing church, and then obviously the green space on Bolton and the widened street uh, sidewalk to increase the public realm. Next slide. That's it. Yeah. And that is it. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. Any, any questions or comments from the board? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, I'm hearing and seeing none. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Um, congratulations and and way to go again. You know, you know, creating and, and preserving. Um, creating new space uh, with, with preserving our history. I, I really, uh, really like it. Thank you very much. Okay. Great. Um, let's see, item number 33, right? Yeah. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 24 residential rental units or IDP units, 25 parking spaces, and 26 bicycle spaces located at 363 East Street to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for the necessary zoning relief and to take all related actions. Uh, Stephen and Mark. Uh, good evening and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Jameson. Uh, again, my name is Stephen Harvey and I'm a project manager at the BPA and I thank you for your time today. Uh, the final project I bring before you today is 363 East Street located in South Boston. On September 1st, 2021, the Boston Planning and Development Agency received a small project review application from the proponent. The proponent proposed to construct a four-story residential building 
on the site where the St. Vincent's Church Rectory currently sits. The new residential structure will contain 24 rental units, 25 parking spaces, and 26 bicycle parking spaces. If approved, the proposal would add four affordable units to the city's affordable unit housing stock. I held two virtual public meetings for the project. Both meetings were well attended and overall feedback for the project was positive. Both virtual public meetings were advertised in the local paper and by email. The comment period for the project ended on October 15, 2021. Once again, I would like to turn it over to the Community Affairs Liaison, Mark McGonigal, to touch on the planning context for the area. Once Mark runs through the planning context slide, Shane, the project architect, will present the project proposal. George Moranti, the project attorney, is also in attendance. Once the presentation is complete, we will answer any questions put forward by the board. Thank you again for your time uh, this evening. Thank you once again, Stephen, and good evening once again, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the planning context uh, for this project, very similar, similar right across the street, also not an active planning area. Uh, also, of course, mid neighborhood fabric. Uh, other neighborhood context, of course, same as last time, very close proximity uh, to Buckley Playground. It's also a through lot from West Third uh, to Bolton Street. Uh, zoning code implications. This also falls in the Article 68 as amended in the South Boston Rezoning Initiative of 2016. Uh, this project does uh, slightly uh, go higher than those dimensions of uh, 43 feet versus 40 respectively and an FAR approximately 2.5 versus 2. Uh, but again, we're getting four IDP units and uh, a very sizable contribution towards that Buckley playground. Uh, that was also a result of community feedback uh, that the folks wanted to see the community benefit go to the neighborhood playground. So with that, I will pass it over to Shane once again. Thank you. Good evening again, Madam Secretary, members of the board, Director Jemison, Secretary Columbus. I'm Shane Losey with Chew and Company Architects, representing the project team for 363 East Street. Um, here's an aerial view from the northwest. Uh, we can see the former St. Vincent de Paul Church in the foreground. Projects across the street from that is the former rectory of the church and also a small single family. Um, that white building on the right is a separate single family and then another church building adjacent to that on West 3rd Street. Next slide, please. On the left, we have West 3rd Street from E Street. Um, the building in the foreground is the single family I just talked about. Um, the light bluish building second in is a former church building. On the right, we have the view from West 3rd Street looking back towards E Street. Um, the light blue building is the, a former church building and the white building next to it in between that and the church is a single family. And you can see the church in the background. Next slide, please. Um, this is the corner of Bolton and E Street. We have the former church rectory. Um, it's a two-story gable front. It has a parking lot on the right side, which you can see a little bit in this photo that faces on E Street. Um, as we move to the right photo, this is the back side of the rectory. Um, you can see the parking lot in the back. And again, that narrow sidewalk that exists with on, uh, on Bolton Street currently. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have the proposed site plan for the project. Um, starting at the top, we are proposing to close off uh, the large curb cuts that exist on Bolton Street now, and then widening Bolton Street from the current four feet to seven and a half feet total. Um, and then our access to the garage is off Bolton Street through a small curb cut on this side as well. As we move around to E Street on the left, um, we're closing a large curb, cuts that, curb cut that is there now. Um, we're adding some sidewalk depth on our property to make the sidewalks nine and a half feet from the current seven and a half, seven and three quarter feet. Um, and then as we, the two trees that are there are existing site uh, street trees. And then as we turn the corner down West Third, we are increasing that sidewalk to nine and a half feet. Um, next slide, please. At 
this is the proposed ground floor level. Um, uh, again, on the top of the screen is Bolton Street, and the access to the garage and the 24 parking spaces is off of there. We're increasing that sidewalk depth. At the corner of Bolton and E, we have the bike room, which we have lots of glass in, and it you know, really opens it up to the outside. We have the entry, the main entry to the building next to that, and then as we go down E Street and turn the corner on West 3rd, we have some residential uses. So as you can see, we'll to see in the elevations, we've made this more of a residential feel. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the proposed E Street elevation. Um, as you can see on the level, uh, lower left is the bike room with the increased glass area to open it up to the outside. And then as we move down the building, we have kind of a more residential feel where we have units on that lower level. Um, the building's broken up in scale, the whole middle section stepped back, which we can see in a rendering a few slides from here um, to kind of put the building in more context with the smaller buildings that are around it. Um, the materials we are proposing are fiber cement, cladboard, uh, poly ash panel on the lower level, and um, composite slate for the mansard. Um, next slide, please. So this is the Bolton Street elevation. Um, again, similar materials fiber cement, composite slate, um, poly ash at the lower level. We have inset decks, again, to kind of break up the mass of the building. Um, and it makes it a little more contextual with some of the adjacent buildings. Um, and next slide, please. Here we have the third street elevation. Um, as you see, the site grade kind of slopes up as we come around the building. Uh, this is where we have the residential uses on the ground floor. So we've kind of, we have the windows reflecting that difference in use from the rest of the building. And again, the inset porches to try to break up some of that mass and provide some open space for um, the residents. And the next slide, please. This is the rear elevation. Again, we have some inset decks. Um, there's some in and out with some of the building elements here, so it reads flat, but it's actually the left side of the building is further away than the right side of the building. And then we see the church in the background, just as kind of a, a show of mass of this versus what's there now. Um, next slide, please. And here's just a rendering from the corner of E Street and West Third uh, showing the proposal, as you can see, kind of stepping the middle section of the E Street side on the left back. We have the bays um, on the right side on West Third Street. We have the inset balconies to try to kind of break up that mass. Um, and then at the lower level, we have the more residential feel of the building, which kind of fits in with some of the other buildings on the street. I believe that was it for me. Any questions? Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Really transformative uh, designs, uh, this and the previous one. They look terrific. Thank you. Great, great. Um, okay, so uh, if there are no further comments, um, the motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Lincoln Smart? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much. Have a good night. You too. Um, we'll be here for a little bit longer, but not too much. <laughs> okay. Um, item number 34 request authorization to adopt the Second Amendment to the report and decision on the Maverick Gardens Chapter 121A project which involves uh, approval of a change to the limited partnership interests of the owner of the project. The Maverick Gardens Chapter 121A project is comprised of parcels located at such addresses on the following streets as further identified in the application. Border Street, New Street, Sumner Street, 
Liverpool Street, London Street, uh, Landing Street, Maverick Street, Cunard Way, and Hav Haver Street uh, in the East Boston neighborhood. Matt. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hymas and Director Jimison. I am Matt Donovan. I'm an attorney in the Office of General Counsel. For you today is a request for authorization to approve the second amendment to the report decision for the Maverick Gardens Chapter 121A project in the East Boston neighborhood. The project's comprised of four phases and consists of HUD Hope 6 funded public housing revitalization efforts, which created a total of 396 units, 77% of which are affordable at or below 60% AMI. On May 1st, 2003, the BPA board voted to adopt the report and decision on the project, and originally that created three phases. Phase one was owned by Trinity's Boston Limited Partnership. Phase two was owned by Trinity's Boston Two Limited Partnership. And phase three was owned by Trinity's Boston Three Limited Partnership. On February 3rd, 2005, the BPA board voted to approve the application of Trinity's Boston Three Limited Partnership, the owner of phase three to split phase three into phases three and four. Additionally, the board approved the creation of Trinity's Boston Four Limited Partnership to own and operate the newly created phase four. Before you today, we have the second amendment. The application comes from the owners of all four phases. They request, they request authorization to assign their limited partnership interest and their special limited partnership interest in all four phases to be assumed by East Boston Community Development Corporation. The ownership structure of all four phases is the same. They are comprised of a general partner, a limited partner, and a special limited partner. In all four phases, the general partner is Trinity Financial. That's not going to change today. The limited partnership interest is owned by Nationwide Affordable Housing Fund, Ex Apollo Tax Credit Fund, 32 Limited Partnership. And the special limited partnership interest in all four phases is owned by RBC Community Investments Manager 2, Inc. Today's second amendment to the report and decision will approve the transfer of the limited partnership interest and the special limited partnership interest in all four phases to the East Boston Community Development Corporation, a well-known nonprofit in the East Boston neighborhood. In accordance with the relevant statutory provisions, the General Counsel has determined that the changes set forth in the application and the Second Amendment to the report and decision do not collectively constitute a fundamental change. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And okay, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for the vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you. The motion passes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, so we did 35 um, in the public hearing. Item number 36 has been removed. Item number 37, request authorization to approve the Boston Redevelopment Authority uh, FY23 budget. Michelle? Good, Good evening, evening, Madam Chair, members, members of the board. board. Secretary oh, Thomas. Michelle, you've got some echo. Oh. Just a moment. Have I resolved that? Uh, not really, but I think we could probably work through it. Please now. No, but I, I think we're, we're, we're just going to go with it. I, we, we can totally understand you. <laughs> Great. Uh, so then, uh, no new information. We're just seeking a vote for the BRA portion of the uh, FY23 budget. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. A roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. <clears throat> Item number 38, contractual. I need a motion to pay our bills. I move that we pay our bills. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Please pay the bills. And item number 39, personnel, Michael. It's actually Heather, sorry. Um, I'm filling in for Michael. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, Director Jemison. We just have a few items for your consideration on the BRA agenda. 
uh, one employment service contractor with details in your board package, Caroline Van Ass in the director's office, uh, and four departures uh, with details also listed in your package, Elizabeth Torres, housing policy assistant in the compliance department, Peter Sasso, director of compliance uh, in the compliance department, Jennifer Kaplan, senior planner one in the planning department, and Ann Dwyer, administrative assistant in the real estate department. And just um, one last addition for personnel is just to wish Teresa Polhemus a happy birthday. Thank you for sharing your special day with all of us. Awesome, thank you very much, Heather. Um, and yes, uh, happy birthday, Teresa. We, we appreciate you and all, and all you do. Um, so thank you for being here with us. Um, okay, we need a, uh, a motion is in order. Uh, so moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Uh, Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Um, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Um, and finally, um, item number 40, director's update. Uh, Director Jemison, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for um, Thanks so much for the uh, introduction, uh, Chair. Um, I wanted to just provide a few uh, updates, um, a few project highlights, um, and talk a little bit about something that was announced yesterday, uh, a land audit. Um, uh, so just to, to get started with that, I did want to say a really um, hearty thank you to you, the board, for, um, for uh, the, that was the beginning last, uh, last month, the, the vote was the beginning of a really exciting month for me of learning from uh, and with the, uh, the leadership of this agency, the, the just how much exciting stuff is happening in the city right now. Um, I, I remain um, I, I remain in awe of some of the, the kind of work that's going on in this agency and the chance to get exposed to it again for the last 30 days has been uh, a huge amount of fun. I did want to take a moment to uh, thank the talented staff that uh, work so hard to prepare uh, tonight's agenda and uh, just tell you that there's a, a several months of additional um, activity like this uh, that's built up behind it. Um, just to sort of highlight a little bit uh, of some of the highlights tonight, you know, uh, this, this team and, and you, the board, uh, approved 13 new development projects, um, totaling approximately 567 new residential units, of which 210. Uh, were income restricted. Um, I, I did want to say that you know, among the projects uh, that have a mix of incomes, um, you know, you, you've got uh, oh, almost all of them were over 13% uh, um, IDP units, um, most of them 15 to 17%. So people are proposing more units than required uh, and having those numbers approved. Um, there's over $252 million worth of projects proposed here. Um, and the commercial square uh, and, and residential square footage uh, approved today is, is over 875,000. Um, 700 and trades people will go to work, uh, 18 new direct jobs and 375 uh, indirect jobs will be created by what was approved in today's agenda. And I know this is consistent with the way we reported the impact of uh, board agendas. We may be adding additional metrics to help even more fully characterize the impact um, that these approvals have. Um, so, uh, with with that, thank you. And the uh, and the highlight uh, of the development projects approved tonight. I did want to just provide a little bit of a, a color on an announcement that took place yesterday that it, uh, our staff was really involved in, uh, along with the city staff. Um, just to highlight it because it's important uh, for your background. Uh, I was able to join the mayor uh, and Chief uh, Dillon yesterday along with Chief Franklin Hodge, uh, to talk about a city-owned land uh, and a land audit that was recently completed uh, that included BPDA-owned land. The announcement took place at um, Bunker, uh, Bunker Hill uh, Community College parking lots that are owned by the agency, uh, which really have great potential to become a, a range of different things that, um, that residents of Charlestown uh, might want them to become. Affordable housing, market housing, and a mixture. Um, uh, open space, um, room for great transportation improvements to uh, deal with some of the challenges uh, that transportation has in that area. Um, but that's just a, a one site 
uh, of 250 sites belonging to BPDA uh, that were identified in the audit. Uh, and we're just excited about the fact that this audit has identified so many places uh, around the city in every part of the city uh, where we can realize some of the uh, neighborhood goals uh, that uh, the people have for the city. Um, we're going to be beginning community process um, on these sites and including them into the plans we're working on. The site we were in in Charlestown is going to be part of the uh, plan Charlestown work that's ongoing. Um, but we also get to expose all of these um, all these sites to our new DEI requirements um, that will encourage the um, uh, putting to work um, a set of firms and people that really represent uh, the wide range of people in our city. So we're excited about this. I just wanted to highlight it because we were so involved in it and your uh, BPDA staff uh, were such a critical part of making it happen, including in particular uh, folks like Devin, Kirk, and, um, and Rebecca. Um, so a, a large number of, uh, of folks participated in it, people I haven't named, but it's a, it's a long list. I wanted to at least highlight a couple. Um, what do you know about that? And with that, I would uh, sort of conclude my comments today uh, and say I'm looking forward to um, the next uh, month of uh, collaboration uh, and the board agenda that will come forward for July. Okay, thanks so much, Director Jemison. Um, all right, well, that concludes our agenda for, uh, for tonight's meeting. Uh, I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. I move that we adjourn this meeting. Second. We'll call for the vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller, did you want to stay? <laughs> aye. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next month. Thanks. Good night, everybody.